uh, to this. As you can see, it's unit one hydraulic brake systems. So starting right off the bat, um, we're going to incorporate some science and some physics here, and that's Pascal's law. So there's quite a bit of verbiage to Pascal's law, but we're going to at least start with pressure applied to a fluid in one part of a closed system will be transmitted without loss to all other areas of the system. So this whole brake system works on hydraulics, and hydraulics is based on Pascal's law. There's a little bit more to it than that, but this is just an overview. As you can see, we've got a master cylinder, brake lines that go to the front, brake lines that go to the rear. We're going to have calipers that have pistons. We're going to have wheel cylinders in the drum in the rear that have pistons. And so your, your regular service brakes, which means you're pressing the actual brake pedal to slow the vehicle, stop the vehicle, that's going to be all hydraulics. So you do have to have some understanding of Pascal's law, mainly in the event of uh, troubleshooting. So you don't need to know Pascal's law to slap new pads on there. You may need to really understand Pascal's law if a customer comes to the shop and they have a vehicle that's pulling or a spongy pedal or et cetera, right? So we'll add a little bit more. It's the main principle behind hydraulic brakes. Pressure created in the master cylinder is transmitted through the hydraulic braking system as long as the system remains closed and has no leaks. So see, there's a key right there. If it's not closed, like for example, if we have a brake line leaking or something, that starts to cause unintended effects. And that's when the car may come in for some problems. Additionally, a vehicle may lose some or all of its braking abil ability if a leak develops. So when we're talking hydraulics, a, a little bit of a brake fluid leak is really different than a little bit of an oil leak. So you have a little bit of an oil leak, you know, you make sure you keep topping your oil off, you keep checking that dipstick, you know, that's okay. Now I'm not gonna report you to like, I'm not gonna call Gavin Newsom up and be like, oh, somebody's got an oil leak and they're damaging the, the uh, California environment. But with brakes, it's a safety issue if there's a leak. We don't play games with brake fluid leaks because as you can see, some or all of its braking can be affected. Roberto, go ahead. For uh, brake leaks, mm -hmm. is there, so I know that when there's like an oil leak, we add dye into it. Is there some sort of dye for brake leaks too or no? No, it's a good question, but um, some of the stuff we're going to do a, a little bit more in lab, you'll, you'll find finding a brake fluid leak is not a hard thing. You know, like finding an oil leak, it tends to get sludgy and messy. Finding a brake fluid leak is usually very apparent. All you may have to do is have someone jump up in the car and press the pedal, and you should be able to see where the leak is coming from. If not, just see some uh, some 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 dampness. So it's actually quite easy. That we'll do that in the lab. We'll find a brake leak and we'll make a video of it. How's that sound? And then additionally, uh, knowing Pascal's law is going to help in diagnosing problems. All right, so we'll continue. Here is Pascal's law sort of in a, in a diagram. We can use varying amounts of mechanical force to extract variable, varying amounts of mechanical force. So what I mean by that, look, pressure is force per unit area. So for example, um, PSI. If we apply 600 pounds of force to this piston, we can extract... 100 pounds, 200 pounds, 300 pounds, 600 pounds, 1200 pounds, we can basically manipulate the amount of pressure coming out of it, right? So not only can we manipulate it by applying more or less pedal pressure, we can manipulate it by changing our piston sizes. That's what that's what Pascal's law is, is saying here. The same pressure applied over different size surface areas will produce different amounts of force. So let's just go with that 600. If you apply 600 and you have a piston size that's half of its size, right? You apply 600 on the input piston and the output piston's half its size, it's only going to make 300. And so we'll explain that a little bit more but that allows engineers to design brakes to have a precise amount of braking force at each wheel. And that's what they do. And yes, I saw that in the chat. This is not a very strong leg. 
what it's cut out is we're using the brake booster to help out. All right, so let, we need to define some things though. The input force, that's the force applied to the input piston. So let's back up. The input force is this leg. Yeah, that leg is strong, but that's the input, right? The input in the brake system generally is gonna be your master cylinder. That's your input piston, right? And then working pressure is essentially it's the working pressure of the hydraulic fluid. So if, again, if we were to back up, that would be, um, let's just go with, let's call this 600 PSI. It, it actually may be more because that looks like more than a, a larger than a, than a one inch piston. But let's say that our, our working pressure is 600 PSI. That means you could put a gauge on it and you'd measure 600 PSI. Make sense? And then the output force is the force exerted by the output piston. So that, wrong direction, is over here. You put 600 on the input, you may get 300 on the output, right? 200 on the output. You can go more, 1200 on the output. So those are the, you got to understand those. Input, the working is the PSI of the fluid and output is like basically your brake caliper pistons, your wheel cylinder pistons. If you really wanted to get in depth, I could pull over here, I have a mini excavator. That whole thing works on hydraulics. That thing could pick up big, it's a small machine too, but it could pick up big boulders, it could dig, it could do all this. And you're thinking like, how does it do all that? with like a 16 horsepower or a 26 horsepower little diesel. Well, we're gonna manipulate that hydraulic fluid. We're gonna use different input piston, different output piston, different working pressure. Some of those are thousands of PSI. Um, so it can be a lot. Now here it is in an image. Um, let's say this is, we probably never have a brake system this complex, but we could, right? So this is, like, this is our, brake, our brake piston. So, if you look at this input, you're essentially putting a hundred pounds on your, on your master cylinder piston. That doesn't necessarily mean you have to push with a hundred pounds of your leg though, because remember we have a brake pedal that has leverage built in. Additionally, any modern vehicle is gonna have a brake booster that's essentially gonna boost the amount of force that your leg can make. So we're gonna way simplify this and just say, you're pushing a hundred pounds on your master cylinder. Now that master cylinder happens to be a one square inch. So if you were to do the formula, that piston right there would give you exactly one square inch of surface area, cool? And that's actually probably pretty close to a lot of our master cylinders. Then from there, we have it come out of a brake line. And then the brake line essentially splits it off one, two, three, four, five times. If we put a hundred PSI, if we put a hundred pounds on one square inch pist input piston, that means we have a hundred PSI everywhere this is orange, as a matter of fact. So if we have a hundred PSI and we apply that hundred PSI to a three square inch piston, you've got a hundred, what's PSI stand for? Somebody tell me back, what's PSI stand for? Pounds per square inch. Bingo. So if you have a hundred pounds per square inch and you have three square inches, how many pounds do you have? Is it right? 300. Exactly. So really it's actually kind of simple. Um, it's, it's pretty nice. So if you want to, you want to increase your force, you just put a bigger output piston. You want to triple your force. You put three times the output piston. You want to look at a, a supercar with some big old, you know, eight piston calipers in the front of them. You got to figure you've got eight pistons. And if each of those is one inch squared, you now have eight square inches with all those combined. Now you're talking about eight times the clamping force compared to the input piston of the master cylinder. See what I'm saying? So the engineers are going to use these to their advantage, but it's it's not always about increasing. Sometimes we might wanna decrease. Let's just say um, in the rear, because we kind of talked about how the vehicle shifts weight a little bit, we'll talk some more. In the rear, we may want less. So let's look at this again, 100 pounds to the one inch piston, 
100 psi working pressure going to let's just say we'll, we'll we'll pick the bottom one this has a tiny output piston and it's only a quarter of an inch we will get one fourth the input so we're only going to get 25 pounds we only may want 25 pounds because we don't want to squeeze our shoes that hard on a car that's braking because when we brake, all the weight is shifting to the front. So we don't really want to squeeze the rear brakes that hard or we're just going to lock them up and come to a skid will be out of control. So the engineers, you know, run some of these calcs and they figure out what size pistons you should use. And uh, I'll make a little bit of knock on, on uh, people building their own cars. A lot of times people, they don't really know what they're doing. You know, you don't want, if you're going to build a full-on custom car, you don't just put the biggest brakes you can find all around. You'd actually, you'd actually want to come up with, you know, a good number that's going to stop smoothly, safely, maintain, you know, so there's a little bit of engineering that goes in the brake system, I'd say. Let me make it clear. That's not what we do. That may be what you do if you go to school for mechanical engineering, but I'm speaking as technicians to technicians. We don't do that. What we do is we repair the system. We return it to, to normal operation. We, we fix defects. We don't redesign. We don't re-engineer. That's not our area of expertise. So if someone is unhappy with their brake system, there's a little bit we can do for them, but not much. We can just basically make sure it's working properly or get it to work properly per the manufacturer. Cool. If they want it to stop like a different car, then that means it, it needs to have the system redesigned. We're, we're out. It's not what we do. And do not try to do that for a customer, especially if the vehicle's under warranty. We're, we're, we're not engineering and re-engineering and, and doing that. You do some custom cool builds on the side. Great. There's a lot of trial and error there. If it's your car, you're welcome. That's a labor of love. You can spend a lot of hours, make some mistakes, maybe crash it while you're testing it. We don't offer that to customers. Clear? Very good. So, and the math is gonna be the same. If it's a one, if it's a 100 pounds to a one inch input with a one inch output, you get a hundred pounds, right? It's one to one. Now, who thinks this is a better deal? You put in a hundred, you get out 300. Is that a great deal or what? What if it was money? Is anybody interested in putting a hundred dollars in a machine and getting out 300? Yeah, that's what I thought. I knew there'd be some yeses for that. Well, here's a life lesson for you. It doesn't really work that way. If you put in a hundred dollars and you get $300 back, there must've been some sort of a, a catch, you see? So similar with brakes, it's the same. We don't just get to triple the pressure. There's a cost. There is a cost. And I'll tell you what the cost is. We applied a hundred pounds to a one inch piston and we probably moved that about three inches, right? When you step on your pedal, you're moving your master cylinder piston a few inches more than likely, right? Three inches. If you have a three inch output piston and you made 300 pounds, guess what? It didn't move three inches. How much you think it moved? Hmm. Exactly. A third of the input, so that's one inch. Correct. I saw that in the chat. Very good. So that's a little bit more fair. Oh, you want more PSI? Cool. I can give you more PSI, but I'm going to charge you by taking a third of your distance. You want triple the force? No problem. You can have triple the force, but it's only going to be at one third the stroke. The stroke meaning how far it moved. And, you know, that's fine because, I mean, how far do we really need to move our brake pads? We don't really need to move them far. They, they really only come just barely off the rotor. Sometimes they're actually still slightly dragging, which maybe is a bit of a defect. But our brake systems have to be really dialed in because we don't move the rotor. We don't move the pads very far off the rotor because we don't have a lot of room to give, right? So that's that's all part of the design. Now, as we go more into brake fluid... This whole uh, Pascal's law, the hydraulic system, the fact that you can put in 100 pounds, you get 300 pounds, all that's assuming a number of things. The fluid has to be correct for the application. So for example, 
Hydraulic fluid that has specific properties designed for mobile applications, that's our brakes. You can't just put water in there. Water wouldn't, water would actually work hydraulically, but water wouldn't hold up in our, in, in our vehicle. It would freeze in the cold. It would boil when we get it hot, right? Water would be a massive fail. Water would severely corrode the brake lines and the pistons and everything. So it's a hydraulic fluid, but it's specifically made for car brakes. So in fact, um, right around the corner, I have hydraulic fluid. That's for that excavator. That hydraulic fluid works great for the extra excavator. It's better for lubricating the pumps. It operates some of the equipment, but it would not work well for brake systems because the brakes get hot and it would actually cook that oil. Brake fluid has to be able to handle a lot of heat and not boil and not get sludgy. So it's special. Remember, it's used to transfer force while under pressure through the lines and the hoses to the brake units. Brake, basically, caliper pistons and drum wheel cylinders. Those are the brake units. It must have high enough boiling point to remain effective under extreme temperature, right? That's a big problem. And here's why. If you, who's ever boiled water? What happened to the water when you boil it? Someone needs to teach you how to cook. It turns to steam and and or evaporates or boils. Correct. And so if if we break it down really simple, a liquid can't be compressed. So if we're pushing on the input piston, the fluid's not compressing into a smaller space. All it's doing, whatever input power, it transmits that same to the output. Makes sense? So if we jump back, everything we said right here is true and it's great and it's excellent, but we're assuming that that's all liquid in there, right? So if we were to use, let's say that water and we were to get it to 212 degrees, that water would turn into steam. It would basically, it would boil. And if it boils, it becomes a vapor. Now see, here's the problem with a vapor. You can compress that. So we would go ahead and we would move this input piston three inches and it would start to pressurize this fluid. But instead of moving the output piston one inch, instead we compress the air like this. How do you think that pedal is gonna feel? It's gonna be hard and bouncy, right? Yeah, so there's a term in brakes that we that we use. It's uh, it's almost like a. Oh, what'd you say? Uh, what'd you say, uh, SpongeBob? Oh, there it is, spongy. So you get a customer who's got a spongy brake pedal. Your first thought is, I wonder if there's air in this system, right? Because that because you'll feel the air is spongy. All fluid will be firm. Fluid mixed with air spongy. So if we were to run water in the hydraulic system and it were to boil, we'd end up with spongy brake pedal. But And by the way, we don't put water in our brake system, but slowly over time, as we'll discuss, water can condensate in the brake system. And next thing you know, we get it hot and it boils. And now there's essentially air in there. Technically the air is water vapor that's been, been, been boiled, but that would give us a spongy pedal. And the fix could be bleeding, but if it's really, if the fluid's defective, you know, it's really time for a full brake flush. So brake flush is a good service. I just think it's something that should be sold for a particular reason, right? Kind of like what we were saying, not just because it's on sale and it pays good. Um, so that's kind of what this is saying. If the fluid boils, liquid to vapor, spongy pedal. And that's going to affect how the car stops. And remember that picture from unit, un from the introduction unit, Brakes don't fail me now. Just remember that. Brakes don't fail me now. You might still be able to stop the car, but we don't leave anything operating less than 100%. Cool? Um, so we'll, con we'll continue. It also must have a low freezing point. So, so the boiling point, it has to be able to get hot without boiling point, without uh, boiling. The freezing point, it has to be able to get cold without freezing. Imagine you go to hit the brakes and it's all ice inside the lines. If you're going to get a firm pedal, but it's not going to move the caliper pistons 
into the pad, into the rotor, and it's not going to stop. So you're going to hit the brakes and brakes don't fail me now. Well, they already did. They're frozen. The fluid's frozen. So it's got to be able to go, go to a low temperature without freezing or thickening, like gelling. Like jello wouldn't make a good brake fluid. That would be, that's a no. Nope. So brake fluid is very specific. It's harmful to painted surfaces. Now that was an unintended consequence. We made brake fluid. It could do all these things. It's amazing. If you drip it on the fender while you're topping off brake fluid and you don't wipe it off, the paint will literally fall off the fender and you'll find it on the floor tomorrow. I mean, it will kill the paint. I have seen a brand new car that got shipped from the factory with a leaking master cylinder and it leaked brake fluid while it was out on the lot and being in transport and stuff down the firewall, onto the subframe, onto some more of the body. It totaled the vehicle. Would I have driven it? Heck yeah, I'd have drove it. But you can't sell a car brand new when half the paint's gone and it's rusting. So they literally totaled that car due to a brake fluid leak. Brake fluid is no joke. Brake fluid is one of the few things, if I got it on my skin, I'll stop what I'm doing and go wash it off like immediately. It's irritating, it's nasty. Don't get brake fluid in your eye. If you really hated someone, go ahead and wipe their whole car down with brake fluid. It'll totally trash their paint. I'll tell on you. I'll tell. I'll tattle. I'll do it. All right. Then, sadly, another another uh, negative of brake fluid, but, but this one is actually intended. This wasn't an accident, but it's a negative. It's hygro, say this word with me, hygroscopic. It's not a D, it's a G. That means can absorb moisture from the atmosphere. It can even absorb moisture through the flexible hoses. Now here's the problem. If it absorbs moisture, now it's essentially got water, right? It's got moisture in there. So if it's got moisture in there, that means it can be, it can, it can um, boil, right? So that's when we get our spongy petal and that's et cetera. So, so think about, Think about that's the negative. It's hygroscopic, so it, it absorbs the water and that makes it so that it gets a spongy brake pedal and stuff. And also in some cases, let's say you guys had a really cool car, like for me, I kind of go back and forth, but, but if I could just snap my fingers and have my way, I'd get a 67 Camaro, but it wouldn't be a stock one. I mean, I'd do a full resto mod, you know, full, I'd probably do the same as the ZL1, the LT4. I mean, I'd hook it up. But let's just say I got that. And then it mostly spent its time sitting around the shop. Didn't really get driven that much. And next thing you know, it's 10 years, wouldn't be 10 years old, but it'd be, it'd be 10 years since I built it and put the brake fluid in it. That brake fluid has probably absorbed moisture through the flex hoses and everywhere. Now that moisture is mixed in with the brake fluid. Why is that such a big problem if the car is just sitting around? Think of what that moisture could do inside the system. Anybody? Cause rust? Yeah, and it does. It does. It could cause both of those, actually. Ice is one concern, but I'm going to explain that in a second. Uh, if that break, if that water is sitting in the brake fluid, and let's just say the water tends to settle the bottom, next thing you know, that water is laying in the bore, right? And you have a master cylinder with a piston, and that piston is supposed to go over a nice smooth bore, but instead it's rusted and rust means pitting. And now you have rust and pitting and that will tend to tear a seal, tear a, tear a master cylinder seal, tear a caliper seal, tear a wheel, a wheel cylinder seal. So that it is a maintenance to do a brake flush because if there's moisture, not only can it cause the sponginess, it can also rust the parts internally inside. They'll rust from the inside out including the brake lines, but it would take a little while for the brake lines. The brake lines that I see that are rusted, it's because they're in a, they're in the Northern area where I grew up. I still haven't been in California as long as I was in New York. So I'm, I still, I still got it a little bit, but they would put salt on the roads and the salt would get on the brake lines and corrode them. And you'd look under and the brake lines to just be totally rusty, crusty. It takes a long time for brake lines to rust out, but it doesn't take a long time to etch into one of the piston bores and, and eventually tear the seal. So we'll go more. Now about the ice part. 
Yeah. I mean, imagine if you got water in your brake fluid and then it turned to ice. That would be horrifying. What what if it was right in the middle of your brake line and it and it froze solid with ice? Now you would have no brake pressure to the caliper or to the drum. And that's a that's the reason it's hygroscopic. It absorbs it, but it disperses it all throughout the system. So you'll never end up with a chunk of water that becomes a chunk of ice. That's the whole reason they design it. So the positive is if there's any water in the system, it'll spread it out evenly. And the negative is it is constantly absorbing water and constantly ruining our brake fluid. And that's part of the reason we need to do so much maintenance on it. So nothing's free in life, is it? Um, so we'll, we'll, we'll continue. Um, now, it, there's a few more things that the engineers who make the brake fluid have to consider. The pH value, is it gonna be acidic? Is it gonna eat away at the materials? The viscosity, so viscosity meaning like if it's if it's too thick, it could make a sluggish uh, brake application. Resistance to oxidation, that's meaning like it can't cause rust in the system. Oxidation is uh, basically oxidation on iron, something ferrous, which contains iron, is rust. When you see rust, that's a form of oxidation. When you see aluminum, it doesn't rust. It turns kind of white and chalky. That's still oxidation. And then it needs to be stable over time and the boiling point has to be considered. So they look at all these things to make sure that it's compliant. Like here's a, here's a um, example. Um, for example, dot three, they make of polyglycol, it's amber colored. The boiling point, if it has no water in it is 401, so that's pretty good. But if it's contaminated with water, that can drop all the way down to 284. And here's the problem. It's it's very likely that our calipers are going to exceed 284 degrees under some heavy braking. So if the caliper is over 284, that fluid is going to be boiling. And now we have spongy pedal unsafe. That's essentially called a hydraulic brake fade, in fact. And we'll cover that in a minute. Now, let's say you want to do... Um, you want to you wanna fix that. You could do two things. You could flush it. And if you get it back to dry, 401 is probably good. But if we have a car that's a little more high performance, let's say um, let's say you, you got the Camry TRD, you may actually call out, yeah, a 2001 Corolla wasn't what I was thinking, but we could go with that. Let's say it's a 2001 Corolla, Marty. I saw that. And you drive it like an animal. Um, you may, you could bump it up to dot four. Dot four is legit. You could totally put dot four in there. You bump it up to dot four. Now you got up to 446 degrees dry and 311 wet. So it's going to help all around. A dot four upgrade um, is something totally legit for sure. Now, if dot four is better, then wouldn't you say it's true? We could go to dot five. To do a, oh, oh, what's this say here? It's no longer polyglycol. It's no longer amber colored, it's purple. It's silicone, it's purple. And yes, it's good to 500 degrees dry and 356 wet, but what's it say here, not compatible. You cannot mix dot three or four with five. Dot five is race car. If I were to build that Camaro, I'd probably put dot five in there. And the reason I would do that is because it's silicone based which means it's actually not hygroscopic. However, it will not work with ABS. And that'd be an old car, so it wouldn't have ABS. Yeah. But if it's a car with ABS, dot five is out. Can't be using no dot five. Purple brake fluid is a no-no. So what they did, dot five came out first, and then they realized, oh, you know what? People want the performance benefits of dot five, but they have ABS. So they came out with 5.1. So 5.1 is like basically uh, everything good about dot five, except it's still polyglycol. So you can run it with ABS. The only negative is it still absorbs water. So you still have to do the maintenance on it. Kind of makes sense. It's pretty fun. Um, and then as we get a little bit further in, we're jumping in the master cylinder here. This is a master cylinder. The master cylinder converts brake pedal force into hydraulic pressure that's transferred to the wheel brake units. That's the calipers and the wheel cylinders, remember? So essentially the brake master cylinder takes your leg power 
and makes it into hydraulic force in PSI. So this is a type of master cylinder that's very simple, but full disclaimer here, we do not use single piston master cylinders. It's great to cover because it's a, it's a simple starting point, but a single piston master cylinder hasn't been used like since the 60s, right? And so here you go. One, it's a one piston with two cups. The cup is another name for a seal. It's a specific type of seal. So if you have a cup, in fact, these are called the piston cup. So just like, you know, cars, you know, that one, that cars, Lightning McQueen, so the piston cup. So that's how you can remember that. Pretty good, I think, personally, I mean, to myself. So piston cup would be uh, a specific shape seal that kind of like scoops the fluid and it, it they, they seal really well, more than just an O-ring. If it was an O-ring, that O-ring would like roll over, that O-ring would wear out too quick. So the piston cup should be long lasting. And as you can see, the primary is the is the first one. So like if you push the pedal, it's actually gonna, the primary is actually gonna touch the fluid first, primary. It's, it's the main seal. The secondary is the second one to touch the fluid. And that one has kind of a little bit of a difference. This one's a lot tougher. This one is made to build PSI. This rear one is made to stop fluid from leaking out the back of the piston. So if this one builds pressure, this one keeps stuff dry, basically. Primary building pressure, right? And if we pump that master cylinder, that seal is going to basically... Well, it's going to do two things. And, and one of them I'm going to cover lightly, and then I'm going to cover it in more detail. But, but at this point, we haven't pumped the pedal. So you can see the brake fluid can actually go down into the piston, air into the, like into the cylinder. We'll call it the cylinder. But also the, the fluid can actually go up into the reservoir. So you see this upper half is the reservoir. The reservoir takes the extra fluid. It basically gives it fluid. I kind of think of it like a, like, almost kind of like a rabbit feeder, except with water. You know, the ones where you, how you how you hang a bottle on the cage for the rabbit and as long as the rabbit would lick it, you know, there's plenty of water. Basically the, the reservoir holds all the fluid you'll ever need and more. And when that compensating port right there is exposed, fluid can go into the reservoir, come out of the reservoir, it's all equalized. But if you think about it, when you start to press on the brake pedal, we can't have all the fluid leak up in the reservoir. So the, the primary seal has to block off that compensating port first. And once that's blocked off, now we have the fluid kind of trapped. And as we step on it, we can actually start to move the fluid and we can pressurize the fluid. And that's what happens when we literally, when we step on the pedal. Now, when we pressurize the fluid, we're moving it. We're actually pushing it into the line through the outlet port. And then we're gonna push that down to whatever, down, down, down the lines to the flex hoses, to the calipers or to the wheel cylinders and the drums. That's what we're doing. Cool. And so essentially what we're gonna talk about is what happens if a primary piston goes, uh, primary piston cup goes bad. What happens if a secondary piston cup goes bad? They cause kind of different things. So continue. Here's that single piston master cylinder again. They talk a lot about holes are drilled. So, so a lot of times they'll do some interesting things, like they'll put small holes in the cup or in the piston. So, so that way, essentially, it doesn't, um, it doesn't. The way I'm going to explain it is kind of weird. It doesn't churn up the brake fluid so much. So, if you were to ever like, let's say you jumped in the pool and you started flailing your arms around underwater, you ever notice all of a sudden you'll make like all these bubbles? You'll basically bring out dissolved bubbles. If you bring out dissolved bubbles in the brake system, that's gonna cause sponginess. So the pistons are designed in a way so that they're, they're, they're not gonna make a vacuum, they're not gonna churn the, the, the brake fluid up too much to, to bring out the dissolved bubbles and that they call that recuperation. So that's just a fun, um, a fun little addition for you to know they're designed very specifically. And then sometimes on a drum brake system, brake fluid could be returning to the master cylinder 
And it's a little weird to explain, but we want to leave just a little bit of pressure in there. So that way it doesn't collapse the wheel cylinders. So if you ever hear this term residual check valve, well, a lot of times make it so it'll just hold a, like a PSI or two or even it, or even literally zero, but it is possible. Sometimes the piston will come back so much. It could actually kind of draw it into a vacuum. It'd be very slight, but it could collapse our wheel cylinders. That doesn't really happen with calipers, but that's all the internal design. We generally don't have to deal much with this because the engineers design it. It doesn't really malfunction. So most technicians don't even know about it. Um, so it's kind of interesting. Now let's jump into the tandem. And we're going to spend more time in the tandem because the tandem is what all the cars have. But first I'll explain why we have it. So let's just say we're, we're we have a 1966 something car that has a single chamber master cylinder. If you blow a brake line, what happens to your car when you're trying to stop? Correct, I see in the chat, it doesn't stop. That's 100% right. Your brake pedal goes all the way to the floor. You have no brakes, you have no nothing. And then you use your e-brake, which is really a parking brake. Right? It's not emergency brake for sure, by all means. If you're in a jam, you stomp it or you pull it up or whatever. But that is not real safe. That's kind of a crappy design. So... If you understand the shortcomings of that, you can you can easily see like where this could go. Let's do a tandem. Now, if we have a tandem, we have the primary and we have the secondary. And it's a little bit weird, right? Because the primary is the first one that your pedal hits. And the secondary is the second one your pedal hits. But on those pistons, this is the primary seal and this is the secondary seal. So you can't say which one's more forward and back because they're kind of opposite. So in this tandem, we basically have all the same features of a single, except we do it two times in one assembly. So let's say this front uh, chamber goes to the rear brakes. And let's say this rear chamber goes to the front brakes because it's also typically how they are. When you step on the pedal, your primary piston is gonna start moving first. Your primary piston cup seal is going to block off the compensating port. It's going to whoops, compress this fluid right here. And as you can see, this fluid is going to go out and it's going to go to your front brakes. But additionally, that fluid's also shoving right up to the back of the secondary piston. It's going to push on the secondary piston, which is sealed pretty well with this uh, secondary cup seal. And it's the fluid itself is actually going to move the secondary piston. They don't touch. They don't have to touch. There's fluid between them and the fluid gets pressurized. So the secondary piston moves as well, blocks off the compensating port and shoves the fluid to the rear brakes. So now we have front brakes and rear brakes being applied by two separate pistons. Now think about this. What if we pop the brake line going to the rear brakes on a modern car with the tandem tandem master cylinder? What do you think happens? No brakes? The front will work, but the rear won't. Exactly. So we still get some braking. The braking won't be normal, but it's enough to stop. I can tell you firsthand, um, in my truck, quite a few years, when I was at your stage, the truck I, the truck I bought my first year of community college this happened to so i've driven some trash worse than some of what you guys drive I still kind of do but this truck i was driving it was rusty i bought it for 900 bucks and then i fixed a little bit but i didn't have the money to fix much i went to stop and boom the rear brake line blew and it was pretty scary because i couldn't stop that fast but it dropped pretty close to the floor and then it firmed up a little bit so think about that. It dropped pretty close to the floor and then it firmed up. Well, that's kind of interesting. How would it do that? However, shortly after the red brake light came on. So it was an indication to me. I mean, I already kind of knew what happened. That's not the only car I've blown brake lines on. So that's kind of the problem. Uh, 
Yeah, it was a good deal. I see that in the chat. I can't control inflation and things have changed and I feel bad for you. Genuinely, I do. But this truck was a piece of crap though, for real. And I loved it. Her name was Bessie. So when the brake line blew, I'll tell you exactly what happened. The primary piston was working, pressurized the secondary piston, pressurized the fluid, then boom, bang, big leak. All of a sudden, if there's a leak, don't you can kind of imagine this piston would go forward, right? Because now there's a leak in the system. So it wasn't pressurizing this fluid anymore. It went ahead and went forward. But this piston bottoms out at the end of the bore, and that stops it. That's why the brake pedal dropped low. I was literally feeling the secondary piston move and then hit the end of the bore and stop. And at the point that that one stopped, the primary piston was still able to build pressure, but only going to the fronts. So that's exactly what happened. And you could feel it. So it's, it's a very strange feeling because the brake pedal is mushy, 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 mushy. And then you're, and you're pretty low to the floor and all of a sudden it firms up. It's not on the floor it's not actually buried bottomed out to the to the floorboard it's just way too low and way sketchy now look what happens in the reservoir this reservoir both front and rear brakes share the same reservoir in this case but look there's a little wall it's almost like a little divider the divider doesn't go all the way to the top though the divider would be here or somewhere down here so as long as your brake fluid level is pretty high it would spill over and keep the other one full but let's say this secondary, the rear brakes, blew the brake line. This fluid will actually leak out. It'll be gone. That fluid will be gone. But because we have the little divider, the wall, it'll keep the primary fluid in. So I would, I would still have brakes. But the float level would be low. So the red brake light would come on. Or if we have a pressure differential valve, which we're going to cover, the brake light would come on. So they're designed like that. The red brake light would be on. You'd be like, okay, something's up with the brakes. Bring it for service immediately. Okay, now you guys um, are in Southern California. So brake lines being rusted and blowing is probably not realistic. However, everything I described is exactly the same if you totally blow out a, a, a cup seal. So if you were to blow out this secondary cup seal, it feel the same. Pedal would drop closer to the floor and then build pressure. It's exactly the same. Cool. It's kind of fun. Now we'll continue on that. This is Toyota's uh, specific. And Madi, I'm going to answer that question at the end. So this is Toyota specific. Um, basically the same exact design. You're going to push on the, on the piston. This has got the front piston. Um, the, the primary piston has a primary cup, a secondary cup, and a, it, it's got its own compensating port. The inlet port basically allows fluid to go behind the cup seal. Um, and then there's a, a lot of times there's a spring and that's mostly to give you a good feel. And then the secondary piston has the primary cup and the secondary cup, all the same. Um, and sometimes they have a stopper bolt to stop it from going back too far, but not real super big deal. Um, but this is a Toyota specific image. So let's just say um, we had a primary piston with a secondary cup seal leak. Where do you guys think that fluid's gonna go? The cup seal's right here. So if this amber fluid were to leak out this way, where's that going? It's at least leaving the master cylinder, right? That's about, that's the only seal that if it fails, the fluid will leak out. So booster, I saw that, that's 100% the correct answer. Absolutely. That's the only seal that will cause a visible leak. And sometimes they're not really visible. It goes into the brake booster. And, you know, there's a whole story about that. So we've had uh, a couple times in the past, actually. Customers come in and they and they complain, hey, I've got uh, my red brake light on. First off, a red brake light could just be caused by the parking brake. So check that. Right. Secondly, 
if you got a red brake light on, that is serious. That that's like you got to figure that out immediately. So let's say you do some troubleshooting and you find the brake fluid's low. You're like, oh, okay, the brake fluid's low. It just needs a little brake fluid. The brake fluid shouldn't be low. Brake fluid doesn't get burnt. It doesn't get used. It, it does. There should be no leaks at all. The brake fluid should never need to be topped off. In fact, I'll take it even a step further. This is going to be a little bit of an explanation for how I lost my hair. If you came, if a car came in and you looked and the brake fluid was supposed to be at the full level, but it was closer to the low level, and you're like, oh, the brake fluid's a little low. Let me top it off. Look, 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 look. Hmm. Now, let's say next time it gets to me and I go to replace the brakes and I'm compressing the piston, that, that piston is extended pretty far initially because the brake pad was thick and now the brake pad's thin. So the piston comes out to make up the difference. Now I go, when I push the piston back in, it pushes the brake fluid in. Now there's not enough space in the reservoir. It overflows the brake fluid. I'm working on the left front wheel. It runs down the master cylinder. It drips on my hair. And that's why, that's why I look this way. It was, it was your fault. You done it. Not only that, I stop what I'm doing and I'm so worried about the paint damage. I focus on rescuing the car from paint damage and I sacrifice my own hair. That does happen. That's what, well, I mean, you'll see. So we don't top it off. We don't. If the brake fluid is towards the low mark, we should check the brake pads and the brake pads should correlate with the fluid level. Low-ish fluid level should mean kind of worn out brakes. If the fluid level is low and you check and the brake pads are thick, then there's something wrong there. Then, then we're going to get a little more serious, right? So I'm going to tell you the story of the, of the car with the mis mysteriously disappearing brake fluid. So this car came in, red brake light on, checked. Hmm, brake fluid was kind of low. Checked the brakes. Brakes were good. The linings were thick. Topped the brake fluid off, shipped the car. Came back a month later. Hey, the brake fluid's low again. It's weird. I looked for leaks. Checked for this. The brake pads are still thick. It's just low again. It needs more brake fluid. Add more brake fluid again. Comes back a month later. It's low again. How can there be fluid loss with no visible leaks? I've already kind of gave you the answer, but tell it back to me. How can that be? Yeah. Primary piston, secondary cup would be leaking into the booster. That fluid would be gone. You know, you know, if it goes in the booster, you know, a vacuum brake booster runs off of an engine vacuum, right? So you know what the engine's doing the whole time? It's, it's like sucking on it like a straw. So the engine is literally sucking the brake fluid out of the booster and saying, yum, 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 yum. The, the engine doesn't care. Engine be like, mm, I love brake fluid. It's great for me. Love this. So that brake fluid is straight disappearing. The, the way you'd actually check it, you'd actually have to unbolt the master cylinder, pull it out a little bit, and then you'd most likely find uh, a dampness on the back of the on the back of the master. And you'd I've even seen where you can see a little bit of a little bit of rusty like dampness, but also rust forming on the booster. And that would be a bit of a giveaway. So kind of a fun one. And we'll talk, by the way, next week is brake boosters. So you got questions on the brake booster. We'll talk about that next week. Um, but I'd like to add that was the only one. So now I want to, you, I want you to look at my mouse here. That was this seal right there. That second, that primary piston, secondary cup seal. If it's this primary cup seal, that's very different. And if it's this secondary cup, secondary seal, that's different. And if it's this secondary uh, piston, primary cup seal, that's very different. It's only one that would cause it to be consumed by the engine. Other ones are way different. So let's continue. There's that master cylinder in motion, right? We step on the, the pedal, it moves the primary piston. Primary piston scoops the fluid, sends it to the front brakes, pressurizes this chamber, which moves the secondary piston, which sends it to the rear brakes. I mean, that's 
basically what happens. Same exact thing with the compensating ports. No, no, not, not a real big complicated deal. They both generally make the same amount of pressure because they're both moving the same amount because between them is, is pressurized fluid. So there should be no loss. Cool. So it's kind of interesting. And then um, let's just say if there's a failure in the secondary circuit, the primary system pushes the secondary piston until it, it bottoms out in the bore. So that's kind of what I had explained. If your secondary fails, the primary still works. And opposite, if the primary fails, the secondary will still work. So what that looks like is kind of interesting. Let's say uh, here's your secondary circuit leak, right? So, so this one failed. You see how there's no fluid in the secondary? Well, we pump the pedal. You'll notice the pedal's way further in. We've we pumped this primary piston much further than we ever have. However, it bottoms out this secondary piston right into the end of the bore. It still pressurizes the front brakes. Oh, yeah. But let's say it's the other way. Let's say it's not like Bessie. Let's say, let's say it's like uh, I had a Mitsubishi Eclipse. And it was actually a clutch line, but let's just say it was a front brake line. If uh, the front brake line blew, look, all the primary uh, piston fluid is gone. So this primary piston would run all the way forward. It wouldn't pressurize the fluid in between. The fluid would have leaked out. But look, it's got a little pin and, and this will actually bottom out. So if, if you look really closely right here, there's a gap in front of that pin. And right here, now the pin's touching. So the pin would, would basically run right into the rear bumper of the secondary piston and the secondary piston will still actuate and build pressure when it's only gonna be the rear. Cool. So they both feel the same. The way the pedal feels, you can't really tell if it's the primary or secondary. How do you think you could tell if it's the primary or secondary? Let me just, let me see if you guys got some input for me. Tell you what, you step on the brake pedal and it's on the lift. Which wheels are going to spin and which wheels are not going to spin? Right? That's how you that's it's that's, a it. that's how you can tell. So simple. Now, if you want to make it a little more technical, because to be honest, typically the, the seals don't totally fail and be blown out. They'll still make pressure, but they may not make as much pressure. And that's where it gets a little tricky. So when we say that the uh, primary and the secondary totally leaking, like you'll find that. But, but let me give you a, another alternative. What if it's just a matter of the primary piston seal failed that's when we get into more like an internal leak. We would build less pressure in the front, normal in the rear, but less in the front. We may actually have to put a gauge on it. I like the idea of pulling, but I want to come back to that. If it's a front and rear split, it's going to mess up either the front or mess up the rear because it's front to rear split. That's not the only design. We'll come back to that as well. And so the next master sonar I'm going to cover real briefly with you Toyota doesn't use these. Um, in fact, I, I'd like nobody to use them, but it's on the ASC. That's a problem. Quick take up. A quick take up master cylinder is used on systems that have low drag brake calipers. So low drag brake calipers is where the caliper squeezes the pad onto the rotor, but then when you release the pedal, it pulls the pads way back. That's why they're low drag. They're not dragging the piston. They're not dragging the pad on the rotor. They pull them way back. So, and again, that's what's saying, larger running clearances, right? It's going to pull it way back. Now they're going to use relatively large diameter piston in the rear of the master cylinder to push a large volume. Let me, let me break that down for you. It's basically going to be a master cylinder with an extra chamber uh, and, an, and a fast fill valve. So it's it's gonna use basically a, an extra uh, chamber. And the purpose of the extra chamber is when you first start to pump the pedal, it's gonna move a lot of fluid really fast, but it's not gonna build a lot of pressure. So if it only builds a little bit of pressure, but it moves a lot of fluid, that will take up the space quickly. Now you understand why it's a quick take up master cylinder. It's a quick take up 
because it's got that additional chamber. That's going to make it uh, get rid of the space. And then it's just going to function like a normal one. So it's not a real big deal. Um, but the reason that we cover it is because, and you may get a question on this. Um, let's say, matter of fact, I can give you the question or I can give you the real life application. And I'll give you both. So um, let's say tech, uh, a vehicle comes into the shop and the brake pedal is spongy on the first application and then the pedal is good on the second application. That kind of sounds like a master cylinder problem. Like the first pump went close to the floor and then the second pump applied the brakes. That could happen on a regular master cylinder, but it's even more prone on the quick take up. Because if that quick take up chamber doesn't take up the space quickly, the pedal will go to the floor. So that would be good. That's, that's an ASC concept. I'll give you the real world application. Um, we had, this one was scary. Uh, when I was working at the Pontiac dealer, I worked at the end bay all the way left. I was, I was the newest guy. They put me wherever, you know, you're going to be all the way at the end. All right, cool. It's good with me. Um, but, and the alignment rack was the very first bay. So it was on the totally opposite end of the shop. So I was doing some work on a trailblazer on the end bay. And then I sold uh, an alignment. I sold a few things, but it came with an alignment. So I drove the other car to the first bay and I was on the alignment rack. And the guy who worked next to me got a Ford Ranger used car that he had done the used car inspection and they sold it. And the complaint was the brake pedal goes to the floor. Not it goes to the floor sometimes, just that it goes to the floor. So he goes out to the car, he steps on the brake pedal, it feels fine. You can't just ship it, right? So he's like, all right, I'll bring it in and I'll look it over. So he pulls it in, but he's already thinking there's nothing wrong with it. So he pulls it in kind of fast. That was his first mistake. Actually, the first mistake was selling the Ford Ranger used. But that wasn't his mistake. So his first mistake was driving it too fast. So he's coming down the, the, down the center of the shop. And what you have to do, you kind of pull into the, into the last bay, put it in reverse, and then pull in. He was the second to last bay. So now you can see he's aiming towards my bay, braking. The problem was he's aiming towards my bay. He hits the brakes. And what do you think happened? Quick take up master cylinder. Brake pedal went to the floor. Did he stop? No. He mowed you down. <laughs> Luckily, I was on the alignment rack. He hit the, he hit the, the, uh, trailblazer on my lift and knocked it off my lift all the way. It was pretty horrifying. And I'm down there doing the alignment. I'm like, dang, I was That's just standing there. So yeah, that's what I'm saying. You gotta, you gotta make you question things sometimes. So he does the diagnosis and, and everybody was a little thrown off because the master cylinder was kind of weird. And that's what it ended up being. The, the quick take up part of the master cylinder didn't work. And so the very first time you hit the brake, it didn't take up the space. The second time took up the space. See what I mean? So it was a good, it was a good little lesson. That's it for quick take up master cylinders because they're not real common. Now let's chat about the application a little bit more. Specifically, this one zooms in really good. When we step on the pedal, I want you to notice this is the piston cup and that is blocking off the compensating port. It's closing it. Now, here's why I want to explain that to you. Sometimes I tell you guys stories for fun, but, but nine times out of 10, probably more than that, like 95%, nine, maybe 99%. I'm telling you a story because it's something you need to know. So I'm going to tell you this story. Uh, it has to do with this concept, okay? So you can know the concept, but I'm going to let you try to think it through to get you to understand. We had at another school, um, we, we were, I was teaching a class, I don't even remember what it was, but they were also doing an intro to auto class. And uh, you know how the intro to auto class is. You, you know, they work on a little bit of everything. They may do an oil change one day, they may do breaks the next day. It's more of just getting them introduced and having some fun. So, and the instructor who taught it really loved to do a lot of live work cars that would come in with problems. So uh, somebody asked him, hey, can you check out my um, brake problem, my Nissan Frontier? I've got a, a, a hard brake pedal. The brake pedal is really firm and it barely stops. 
they diagnosed it, found it was a defective brake booster. Um, they replaced the brake booster. And then they shipped the car and the car came back like an hour later on the tow truck. Like, oh, what'd they leave loose? Mm -hmm. Guess they didn't pay attention in class. And uh, the customer says, well, what happened was they were driving and the car was just going slower and slower and slower until the point where it wouldn't even move. I'm like, okay, that sounds more like, I don't know, maybe you got a transmission issue or something. And so we pull the car off the tow truck, pop it in drive, drive it all over the place, drives great. It's weird. Well, give it back to the customer. The customer takes it again. And I think that was about the end of the day. And then we came back uh, next class day and there it was again. So they had it towed back again and they had it dropped off. And we talked to them, we said, we need some more info because it's driving fine for us. And they said, well, you know what? I paid a lot of attention. It won't do it unless you drive for like at least 20 minutes. So grabbed a student, told them, hey, go drive this for 20 minutes. The longer they drove, the slower it went. And But when a transmission slips, usually the RPMs are going up, kind of like flaring, like, and this was more like it was struggling. It was acting as though you were applying the brakes, but you weren't. And the student had a little bit more uh, understanding than the customer. So the student actually put it in park and got out and started looking and the brakes were like red and smoking. So, okay, the brakes are applying themselves. Can you pick that up so far? All right. It's all the information I'm going to give you for now. Anybody got any ideas what might have happened? Uh, I had a similar situation. Go, Brandon I, first, go ahead. Well, I had a sim uh, similar situation in an Audi with my front brake extension on fire. Uh, mm -hmm. I put the wrong brake fluid and it didn't mix well. So every time I would step on the brakes, I guess, I guess Audi was like, I think Audi is that fine or something like that. But I mixed the wrong Maybe. brake fluid. And uh, interesting. It, it didn't like it and it wouldn't release the uh, pistons off the rotor. And I was huh. driving. And I was dumb, so I kept giving it gas, and I got to the light, and everybody was like, your car is on fire. So I mixed the fluid, so I don't know if that was. Uh, yeah, maybe somehow it swelled up the seals on the piston. Um, somebody else was going to speak up. I couldn't tell who, though. All right, so I'll give you a little bit more info. You, you want to – basically, here's ASC tip number one. If – ASC question says ever since or after the technician did that or something to do with after service on the ASC, it's always something that the technician did wrong or the wrong parts or something. It's something the technician did there. If they say something about it, they're not offering up that detail to distract you. They're letting you know something went wrong in service. Well, I'm letting you know, ever since they did the brake booster, this happens now. They didn't put brake fluid in it. They didn't change the pads. They didn't change the rotors. Ever since they did the brake booster. So if you ever hear something like that, and even on your own car, even on another project, even on a car that you're working on for the dealer, I got my rear end beat into the dirt doing this stupid, this stupid Jeep 3.6 with a ticking knock. I did rocker arms and I ended up, I ended up messing up one of the sensors and I didn't even know it just by having a magnet too close. And I'm thinking like, there's no way, there's no way all of a sudden one of these things is messed up. Cause I didn't even touch it. I, like, but the fact of the matter is if it was fine and then you did the work, basically it's probably something you did now, maybe once in a great while, Something fails while it happens to be in your possession, but on the ASC, no, it's something you did. So now that you know it's something they did, remind me, what did they did? What did they did again? They put in the brake booster. All right, now I'm gonna teach you something. Look at this picture. The brake booster pushes on this primary piston and the brake booster, when you release the pedal, the brake booster allows this primary piston to, to retract all the way but your brake booster has an adjustment so if your adjustment is too long they call it the brake booster push rod 
If your adjustment's too long, that's going to constantly push on that primary piston a little bit. Maybe even just a little bit. Why is that a major concern? Or PSI per square inch, or that Pascal's law no. Good, Good guess, good guess. Good guess, but not quite there. So I want to I wanna go back to this compensating port. Remember this compensating port? When our brake pedal's released, the compensating port allows fluid to go in or fluid to come out. Essentially, I want you to think of the compensating port as it compensates for temperature changes. So when, when a fluid gets warm, what does it do with its space? Does it contract or it expands? Exactly, I see it in the chat. When the fluid expands, it needs somewhere to go. When your brakes are released, it can go right through the compensating port and just go in the reservoir. Cool, that's what it's supposed to do. But the problem was they had it adjusted a little too long. So even when you would release the brakes, the compensating port was blocked. Right. So the brake fluid was was getting warmer after the 20 minute drive. And rather than warmer, meaning vent off through the compensating port in the reservoir, it basically meant expand. Now, what happens when a fluid expands? Let's say that it's a soda can. Hey, soda's kind of soda's maybe not a real great example. Let's make it water. What if you had a water bottle and it was in the sun? What happens when you go to take the cap off? It's hot. Right? It relieves pressure. Exactly. So the brake fluid was warm and it couldn't relieve pressure. So it just continued to build up a little bit more pressure. Now, what happens when we build pressure in the brake system? What, what, what happens? If you pressurize the brake system, what it applies the brakes. Exactly. I see that. And when you apply the brakes, the brakes make more, make more heat, don't they? And that heats up the fluid, which expands it more, which makes more pressure, which makes the brakes apply more, which makes more heat, which expands it more, which makes more pressure, which makes the brakes apply even more, which makes even more heat. And, even, and now do you see, eventually the car wouldn't even move and the rotors were smoking. So... It was all over the tiniest adjustment. And it and if you if you understand the compensating port, like it came back, and that's when he asked me, Hey, what do you think about this? And I was like, What'd you guys do? Right. He didn't say, Teach me Pascal's law, tell me all about brakes. It, my first thing was like, Hey, what'd you do? We put a brake booster in. Okay. Oh, yeah, I, I I know what you did. It's like, what? Man, that guy's smart, honestly. I guarantee you there are people in this class with a higher IQ than me. I'll flat out guarantee it. But I have a little more experience than you and I've studied this stuff a lot more. So when somebody presents a problem and I know the system and I've studied the system and I could say, oh, if your push rod is too long and it blocks your compensating port, it just gets hotter and hotter and hotter and squeezes and squeezes and squeezes. And then by the time you get it back here on the tow truck, it's cooled off and it drives around fine, right? It all clicked in my mind before I even had to put hands on the car. Then of course, when I go to put hands on the car, I'm verifying, right? But my first step, remember last week, strategy-based diagnostics, my first step is understanding the system. So you really need to understand the system. And, and sometimes you'll understand the system and you'll still get beat up. But if you get beat up in every car, it's because you don't know the system. It's just, it's offensive, but it's the truth. And I, I profess to you the truth. Right. And so continuing, that's a little bit about the compensating port. You can see sort of what it does. What's interesting as well is when we let off the pedal, a lot of times this secondary cup is actually made to either roll over to let fluid go by, or sometimes they put holes in there. So they're kind of interesting. Um, and then when, when we release the brakes, remember, we expose the compensating port and that's actually what leads toward to the fluid decreasing in pressure. So let's say we hammer the brakes, we build 500 PSI. We release the brakes. Yeah, the, the, the pressure will release as we release, but like what really does it too is when we expose the compensating port, it equalizes the pressure. So here's a fun thing. If you ever notice, if you start pumping the pedal really fast, 
sometimes the fluid will actually overflow from the reservoir. That's because that fluid is rushing back through that compensating port when you're, when you're coming off the pedal fast. So this week, when we bleed brakes, you need to, you need to pump the pedal slowly, slow down and slow up. Cool. So that's the main jam there. And this talks about the different leakage. So this one, for example, has a uh, primary piston leaking. And this one has a secondary piston. You can tell the primary is leaking because it rammed in the back of the secondary. And then you can tell the secondary leaking because the secondary is rammed to the end of the master cylinder bore. So kind of a review, but just a different, a different way to see it. Um, and there's another type of master cylinder. Uh, we talked about the single piston, the quick take up, the, the tandem. Well, here's one that you're going to see increasingly more common. We actually don't cover this one so much in this unit. This is covered more in unit two. That's me next week. And you have a uh, e-learning that's high, Toyota high tech brakes, uh, H11B, I believe something right along there. This system works kind of different. It does have a brake master cylinder though. The master cylinder is in here, but you can't change it without changing everything. So we had a spongy brake pedal, which was actually caused by um, defective seals inside the master, but we couldn't change just the master. We had to change the whole assembly. You're talking the ABS module, the reservoir, the master, the whole frame and the accumulator or pump, it was 3,800 bucks. So if you get a spongy pedal, you're gonna wanna make sure you've diagnosed it correctly. Now let's jump back to that point. This, for example, doesn't have a, um, this doesn't have a fluid leak externally. This has what we consider an internal leak. So let's discuss internal leaks. Remember, we've got the primary piston right here. It's got a cup seal. Let's just say that cup, cup seal is supposed to scoop the fluid, but the cup seal is torn. So when you pump it, the fluid just goes around. Can you see how that would cause this issue? It's going to be spongy. It's basically going to fun. It's just, it's going to act exactly like Bessie did when I blew that rear brake line. The pedal is going to go low to the floor and then it's going to firm up at the last second. That would be possibly a bad um, piston cup seal internally. So it wouldn't build any pressure. The fluid would just skate its way around. You won't see leakage on the ground. You won't have leakage at the brake lines. You won't really, they're kind of hard to diagnose with your eyes. In fact, you really can't diagnose it with your eyes. Or let's say both of these feel the same. One of them is a primary seal that's bad. One of them is a secondary seal that's bad. Let's go back to how you would diagnose which one is bad, which one's defective. Hmm. I'm gonna I'm gonna try I'm gonna ask you to try to visualize this with me. Here's the thing we could do. If we had a whole bunch of air in the secondary system, it would actually function like this. So what would we do to get the air out? We'd bleed it. So sometimes what people will do when they have a pedal that goes most of the way to the floor, they'll actually just try to bleed the brakes. And if there's a bunch of air and the air comes out and it firms up, then you know you're pretty good, right? Then you know like, okay, there was air in the system. Now, I don't know how the air got there, Right, we may have to do. Maybe it was maybe because it got moisture and the and the water boiled or whatever. That's a hard question, but I will say if there's air in the system, it would cause this issue. So sometimes what we'll do as a first diagnosis is just try to bleed it. You know, we'll just spend a minute just try to bleed it. Have somebody jump up in the driver's seat, pump the brake pedal, hold it down. You'll crack the bleeder. If you get, you know, do that a few times, and if you get big pockets of air, you're like, all right, cool. This pedal's spongy because there's air. But if you bleed it and there's no air in there, ooh, now you got to think, well, maybe it's a problem with the master cylinder. And here's why. If it's a, it, any of the seals in the system can leak, but if it's a caliper seal and it's leaking, the fluid ends up on the ground. 
if it's a wheel cylinder seal and it's leaking, the fluid ends up in the drum and then ultimately in the shoes and then ultimately on the ground. But we might have to actually pull a drum off to find that, but we'll find it. It's an external leak and they'd end up with low fluid. But you'll have a car that will be a spongy pedal with no leaks anywhere. And that's either air or a failed master cylinder seal because the master cylinder cup seals will leak internally. So the fluid's not leaking out. The fluid's leaking from here to there and ultimately up the compensating port. It's not going MIA. It's just not building pressure. So this is what, this is what I would do personally. I would, let's say I suspected the primary piston for whatever reason, I would unthread the brake line and I would put a plug in the primary piston port right now let's just say if i put up if i plugged off the primary system port and i'm going to probably jump to a previous um, picture i think it's going to help a little bit more if i put a plug in the primary piston port right this is the primary right here if i plug that off and the brake pedal gets firm where was the problem Picking up what I'm putting down. In the rear or front? It's a good guess. Let's talk through exactly what we do. Let's say I had a whole bunch of air right here. If I have a whole bunch of air in the primary, I'll pump it and it'll be spongy. If I undo it and I put a plug in it and it gets better, I've basically eliminated the defect by plugging it off. When you plug it off, you essentially disconnect all the lines and you're just basically testing the master cylinder. So if you plug it and the master cylinder gets better, it's not a bad master cylinder. It's got to be somewhere down here. There's got to be air. Maybe air's trapped weird or something. But let's say I plug it and it's still mushy. It's acting like there's air. There can be air. I've plugged it off. See what I'm saying? Better yet, if you really want to do it, if you really want to hook it up, pull both the primary and the secondary lines off and put two plugs in. Now you're not even actuating the brakes at all, all you're literally doing is testing the master cylinder. If you put two plugs in there and you might have to tweak them a little, you might have to like kind of step on the pedal and loosen the two plugs and make sure there's no air like right there at the plug that'll be very easy to bleed. And then you know it's solid and you step on it and that pedal's still sinking. What's that tell you about the internals of the master cylinder? That's going to be the internal leak. Exactly. Yeah. NG. NG is fine. NG is no good. So it, that's, that's the ultimate master cylinder test. You literally eliminate the system, eliminate the line, and plug the master cylinder. Not with janky plugs though. You got to use, like you got to have either special plugs or what I'll do, I'd go to the junkyard. I'd cut the fitting off the master cylinder with like six inches of line and I take the line and I roll it over a few times on the vise and clamp it really hard. And then better yet, you can even weld or braise it and it'll make a dead perfect seal. And you could do it like cheap to free, somewhere between, between cheap and free. And those will be my master cylinder test plugs. That's how I would do it. If that doesn't make sense to you, I want you to review what I said a little bit later and kind of kind of think it through a little bit. And then we could even make a supplemental video on showing you that. The way you're supposed to do it by the book, you're actually supposed to put a gauge on it. And the gauge is, is probably better. It's more effective, right? It is, but the gauge is a mess. Um, you have to actually have the gauge. You're gonna use the gauge. You're gonna get brake fluid all over the gauge. And then you're gonna put that brake fluid nasty gauge in your toolbox and stuff. Like, I just don't, the gauges are not my go-to. It's the right way to do it. But the way I'm going to do it is going to diagnose it equally as effectively, and I'm not going to be putting brake fluid soaked gauges in there. I mean, the gauges drip brake fluid for like the next month. I'm not doing it. So that's one of the diagnosis things, and we're going to talk about that a little bit more later. So we'll jump we'll jump into um, the next section. So that's basically master cylinders. You guys have mastered the master cylinder. We're going to cover this more next week. Now talk about uh, master cylinder reservoir. Sometimes the master cylinder reservoir is built into the master cylinder. Like this one is just a, it's all metal. It's an all metal cylinder with an all metal cap. There's no plastic. It's all one piece. 
More commonly, we have an aluminum master cylinder with a plastic reservoir. A lot of times there's seals right there that uh, where they seal up. Um, this is a cheaper design. In a lot of ways, though, it's probably a better design. So that's typically what you're going to see. And right here is the reservoir float switch. So I want to explain this. If you look right here, this fluid level is full. So when the fluid level is full, this float switch is not touching. When the fluid level is low, this float switch is touching. This is an open circuit, right? This is a closed circuit. Look at the status of the brake warning light bulb. It's off. Tell me, why is it off on the full? Hmm. It's an open circuit. Look, we send 12 volts. 12 volts goes to the lamp. Technically, 12 volts goes through the lamp and 12 volts goes all the way down to this point where it stops because it's an open. So the, volt, so the bulb's out. Now, the second that it goes low and the switch touches, now look at it. 12 volts goes to the bulb. Now I'm going to sneak ahead and say, and the bulb is lit because ground, there is continuity through the switch because it's low and that makes it all the way to the ground, right? So an open switch, light off, a closed switch, light on. An open switch is open because the level is full. A closed switch is closed because the level is low. That's the most common design. There may not be a physical actual switch. It may just be magnetic. So these are these come in proximity with, with each other. So, but that switch may be replaceable or that switch may be part of the, of the reservoir. If we have a, bread, a red brake light on, you may have to troubleshoot this system. We'll talk about that a little bit later. But if you understand the system, it's not a difficult system to troubleshoot. Now, Toyota does it kind of similarly. I'll show you right here. Open switch if it's below, if it's above the min. Close switch if it's below the min. If it's below the min, you get a red brake light. Now, you're not sure if it's the parking brake can provide ground and the brake fluid level switch can provide ground. So sometimes you don't know which one it is. The first thing you should do is just make sure the parking brake is not applied. The second thing you should do is make sure you have brake fluid in it. Then after that, you may have to start disconnecting things and isolating which side of the circuit is providing the ground that you don't want to be there. Makes sense? So it's, it's really not a complicated circuit. Um, and continuing. So let's chat about bleeding for a quick second. If you're going to change a master cylinder, you're about to introduce uh, air to the hydraulic system. Now, I want to explain. This is the first time you've seen a skill drill. Skill drills are basically step-by-steps -step how to perform a job. But I want to talk you through them so you can visualize it. And the whole purpose of talking through them is to help you understand it and also help you be ready for what we're going to be doing tomorrow. So let's say we're going to bleed a, a master cylinder. The reason we do it is because we'd probably be replacing it. Now, if we pop a brand new master cylinder in there and it's bone dry, never had any fluid in it, and we install it into the system and we hook the lines up to it, and then we put fluid in, we start pumping, we're introducing air into the line. Could we all agree? And now you're going to bleed it and you're going to get that air all the way from the master cylinder, all the way down to the bleeder. That's going to take some time. This might be offensive, but that's stupid. That was dumb. You're smarter than that. You just got to think about it first. How can we save time? Because remember, a lot of you are not going to be paid by the hour. You're going to be paid by the job. So it's not to say you need to cut corners and, and not do a good job. It's to say, if you can do something different and save time and still provide the same quality repair, that's the correct way to do it. So... Rather than putting the air in the line and working the air all the way out the end by having Tony, hey, Tony, can you help me jump up in the car, pump the pedal, pump it, Tony, hold it, Tony, crack the bleeder, close it, all right, Tony, pump it, you're wasting two people's time. So it'd be actually better to grab that, that master cylinder, bring it over the vise, use this little bleeder setup. 
because then you can bleed essentially maybe all the air out of it. And then when you bolt it on, you might actually have no air in the system. You might need to do minimal bleeding, if any bleeding. And I'll even show you what I would do that'd be even a little bit more of a tip, all right? So um, we're gonna go ahead and install it in the vise. We're gonna use these tubes. These tubes are gonna dip in the fluid and they're gonna go to the port, right? And then we're gonna actually fill it with fluid. And then if you look, we're gonna actually pump it, pump it, pump it. This one's actually being bled on the car. You could bleed them on the car too. That's pretty cool too. But we'll say we look at this one. Every time you pump it, it's going to pull fluid from the reservoir. It's going to pump it through the port and it's going to send it up in there. What happens if there's an air bubble right here? The air bubble is just going to go out of the system. It's going to go up the hose in the reservoir and then it's going to float up and dissolve. So it's a quick way to get all the air out. You don't have to open valves or close valves or anything. You just literally have to pump it several times make sure the air goes out of it. And this is the tool and some master cylinders actually come with a bench bleeder. That's what bench bleeding is. But I wanna make sure you understand, you don't actually have to have the master cylinder on the bench to bench bleed it. What I would personally do, I would have the master cylinder in the car like this, right? As you can see. And then they've made up some steel lines and they've actually dumped them right up in the reservoir. And then we're actually gonna just pump it right there with, you know, we, we'll have to send somebody in, in the vehicle and they'll have to pump it. But if you notice these brake lines can either A, go right back into the top or B, if you didn't wanna fabricate a line or get the little plastic special tool, what I would do is I'd have somebody just for a moment, hey Tony, hey Tony, how you doing? Jump in the car, Tony, press the pedal. When Tony's pressing on the pedal, I would just come right here and I'd crack that, I'd crack that line loose and any air I'll get out right there at the fitting, right there. And then I'd tighten it. I'd say, pump it, he'd pump it. And I'd say, hold it, hold it, crack it loose, get the air out right there. Eventually when the air stops, I close it and I'd say, hey, Tony, how's it feel? It's got a pretty good pedal. That way I don't have to get all the air with 300 pumps all the way down to the right rear brake line right? The furthest brake line. Kind of see what I'm saying? I would actually kind of do like my own little bleeding at the fitting right where the line is. Now here's a negative. That's going to be a mess. So it does even talk about let's clean it with water. I might put a tray down here. We've cut water bottles in half. We've done all sorts of stuff, but that's how personally I bench bleed them on the car, not on the bench. The next thing is just doing regular bleeding. So this is the Toyota specific approved way. Uh, at least one of one of they have they have several so it talks about you're going to basically this is one person now you're going to basically put hook a hose to the bleeder nipple bring the hose down into the water and then you're going to essentially open up this bleeder and at that point you could actually go yourself and pump the pedal when you pump the pedal it's going to push the air and fluid out the bleeder and out the bleeder, out the bleeder. Now you see this air. When this air makes it down to the pedal, to the uh, jar, the air is gonna dissipate. The reason that we have the hose dipped into the bottle is because every time you release the pedal, it's gonna suck fluid back in. But see, it's never gonna suck air in because the, the hose is submerged in clean brake fluid. So this is like, this is like the one man show. And when I say one man, that includes woman, because it still ends with man. So you're all included. So let's just say you want to do it with one person. You could do this, but you'd probably have to make some sort of like a hanger and some wire and you'd have to hang it off the axle or something. And you could do like one man bleeding. And that's, that's one way to do it. Now there's another way. You send Tony up there and you'd say, this person would close the bleeder and then you'd yell to Tony, hey, pump it. And Tony pumps it, right? Pushes down, brings it up. Sometimes you want to do it multiple times. You can just do it once if you want. But then you got to say, hey, Tony, hold it. And Tony's got to hold the pedal, pressure on the pedal, hold it to the floor, you'd say, but it might not be all the way to the floor. Hold it down, 
That's going to build up pressure in the system. And then you're going to crack the bleeder loose. Don't remove it. Crack it loose a little. Crack it. Crack it loose. And then the fluid's going to come out. Don't let Tony take his foot off the pedal until you close it. Because if you have this open and Tony takes his foot off the pedal, now you're pulling this up backwards, which isn't really a problem if you're submerged in fluid. But a lot of times I won't do that. I'll just go ahead and like get a drain a oil drain pan. And if Tony lets his foot off the pedal while this bleeder's loose, it sucks air back in the caliper. And now I've got air back in the system. See what I'm saying? So the right way would be, hey, Tony, pump it, hold it. Crack it loose. Tighten it. All right, Tony, pump it after it's tight. Hold it, Tony, when he's holding. Crack it loose. Right? That's how you do it. You got to remember that. All right. And then here's another one. We're going to talk about adjusting the master cylinder push rod. This is actually kind of what I was telling you on that um, Nissan Frontier. The push rod was too long. Sometimes the push rod's the master cylinder push rod, and other times it's the brake booster. But typically on a modern car, that's built into the brake booster. So you could still call it the master cylinder push rod, but understand it's actually part of the brake booster. Um, I told you what happens when it's too long. It blocks off the compensating port. It builds pressure, it builds heat, it builds pressure, builds heat, and the car locks up. But I didn't tell you what happens when it's too short. What do you think happens when it's too short? Any ideas? Close, if it was extremely short, you could end up with no brake, but if it's a little too short, now your pedal's lower, your brake application is delayed. Now, remember that picture. Brakes, please don't fail me now. We can't be having our brakes applying later and more sluggish and delayed. So if, if the spec is this much, then we want it to be that much. If your spec is this much and your adjustment is that much, that means the pedal is going to be halfway down to the floor before it really does anything. That would be a, that'd be a fail. That'd be not a good service. So it does, it does uh, have a spec, but I want to be clear. The only reason you'd have to adjust it is someone changed it, the brake pedal linkage has been repaired, or the booster's being replaced. We don't do this every day. This would be like on rare occasions or if we're working on that system specifically. So don't go to your cars and start doing adjustments because... Unless you know you screwed it up, then yeah, you go ahead and do it. But we don't adjust anybody's unless there's there's been something to initiate the adjustment or replacement, basically. All right, cool. And then how? Well, here you go. A lot of times there will be a way to measure the length. And so you'd have to follow service information very carefully. And this, for example, is a straight edge laid across the studs and you're measuring the depth of the micrometer. And I'll actually tell you, how far it should protrude, how far in or out. There are several different tools, but it's going to be an SST. Then when you do go to adjust it, a lot of times there's a wrench to hold the splines and a wrench to adjust the nut. Now the nut is threaded onto a shaft. So if you tighten the nut, it effectively shortens the shaft. But if you loosen the nut, it effectively length lengthens the shaft. The people with the Frontier had the nut loosened and the shaft was lengthened. And that's why the brakes were overheating and messing it up, right? And then let's just say um, you follow all the specs. And then a lot of times it's going to give you some sort of a, a measurement. Then when you're, when you're done, you're going to verify it. It's going to talk about pedal free play, pedal height, and reserve pedal. Those are things that we're going to cover in just a moment. Now, speaking of pedals, because that's when we get into these measurements that are coming up. The pedal's first job is to provide us a bunch of leverage. So it provides us leverage. That's why it's got a longer length from the foot to the pin, but it's actually pivoting up here, which is a shorter length. If let's say this was 50 millimeters and this was 200, that's gonna give us four times the force. And of course, one fourth the movement, right? But so when you saw that number of, you know, 500 pounds or 200 pounds or whatever. At first, this, this person may only put 50 pounds 
But with the leverage, it becomes 200. And then with the booster, it becomes 800, depending on the size of the booster. That's for next week, okay? So there's your layout. And then sometimes they can be actually adjusted, by the way. So just FYI, they may have um, uh, adjustable pedals. And that's adjustable pedals is different than pedal push rod adjustment or master cylinder push rod adjustment. That's totally different. The whole entire bracket will move. Your gas pedal, your brake pedal, everything. Just as a note. Um, like for an example, this is a pedal adjustment and you could actually adjust the pedal and, and measure it. Um, but we'll come back to those measurements that we would need to do, I promise you. So let's talk a little bit, but a little bit more about brake lines and hoses. I don't know if, if I think some Lexuses have adjustable pedals. I'm not sure about Toyotas. They could. Now with brake lines and hoses, we're going to use brake lines and hoses to allow transfer of the pressures that's been created in the master cylinder. We're going to transmit that to the calipers and wheel cylinders. Without it, it's not going to work at all. Um, and so brake lines, they're double walled steel. They're coated to resist corrosion. So those are two important things. If the ASC starts asking about copper tubing, single wall, single, no, no, no. Brake lines are like high end as far as lines go. Double walled, steel, coated to resist corrosion. Cool. They're attached to the body with clips and brackets. So that way we don't have them vibrating all over. Some vehicles, the brake lines are inside the vehicle. Most of them are outside. Yet, these are hard lines. So think about that. If you had a hard line go into your, go into your front brakes and you're turning the steering wheel, how's that hard line going to hold up? It ain't. So where the lines must move, we'll use flexible brake hoses just to allow for steering suspension movement. We only use flexible hoses where we need to because there's movement required there. Steel brake lines would actually be better all the way. Now you may talk about stainless steel brake lines, but we'll get to that in a bit. So here's your steel brake line. If I say brake line or brake pipe, that's what I'm talking about. If I'm pointing to this, that's a hose to me. That's a flex hose or brake hose. This is not a brake line to me. Some people mix it up. I don't. Lines are lines and hoses are hoses. This line actually has some additional corrosion protection right here. They coat them in rubber. Those are pretty nice. Toyota's really good about doing that. This is a Toyota as well. This Toyota has a brake flex hose going from the knuckle that accepts the line to the caliper. This brake hose is actually a lot more known to fail than this solid brake line. It's just a fact. So, right, so as, we can, as we continue, um, they must be able to transmit considerable hydraulic pressure, like 1500 PSI potentially. If the customer jams the brakes hard, you could hit 1500. And there's no seams, double walled. But like, for example, if they were to use copper, that would actually be less corrosive and it'd be so easy to bend brake lines, but not as strong and not going to be able to withstand 1500 PSI. We do not substitute copper lines or anything like that at all. We don't. And they have to conform to standards such as like SAE, Society of Automotive Engineers. So you don't play no games with that. Now take a look. Let's say that um, we're gonna do, uh, replace this brake, this steel brake line. If we had to undo this steel brake line, we'll have to loosen that fitting. This wrench right here is most likely gonna be a flare nut wrench. And that's gonna give us good grip on the fitting. But a lot of times it's recommended to also hold the flex hose. The flex hose comes into this bracket and it's held by this clip and that should prevent it from spinning, but you're kind of stressing out that bracket. So it'd be good to at least hold it. Right here, you gotta be careful. If you start twisting this whole thing, you can snap the line, you can snap the bracket, you can twist and tear this hose. That is the main reason why I'm gonna teach you how to fabricate brake lines. Here in California, I highly doubt you'll ever install brake lines that are rusted. If you want to move because you've had enough of the high cost of living or the massive potholes 
that don't get fixed here, even though we pay the most tax on every gallon of gas sold. Let's say you want to move to the north. You may run into rusty brake lines and you may need to fabricate lines. I've, I've fabricated a bunch of sets of lines and installed them on a bunch of trucks and a few cars. So that's kind of where I come from. But here, you're going to, you're going to say the previous person who taught brakes was like, nope, they don't need to know that it's California. Well, my thought is they go over here and they don't do like a double wrench or they don't hold this well. And next thing you know, they snap a fitting off. Your option is a go to parts and tell them you need a line that may or may not be available. You can get the hose, no argument, but to get a line, some of these lines run between the body and the frame and to replace it all as one piece factory, you'd have to lift the body off the frame. So more than likely, somebody in your shop is going to know how to make brake lines because somebody's going to screw one up eventually. I'm hoping you're the one fixing it, not the one breaking it and then calling someone else to fix it. If you break one, I'm not even mad as long as you can fix it. It's not that, it's not really all that hard to fix, to be honest with you. So I'm going to show you how. And then let's just say like we're dealing mostly with flares. So I want to make sure you all need to know this. This is, for example, a double, it's an in, inverted double flare. So if you say double, double with a D, not double with a B, that's next. Double flare has this shape cone is going to fit this shape cone, but they're going to be like between one and three degrees difference. So that way this metal, which is a little corroded, that, that would actually need to be cleaned, will actually seal to this metal, metal to metal. Did I say gasket? Mm -mm. Did I say Teflon tape? Mm -mm. Did I say RTV, FIPG, liquid Teflon, goop, plastic weld, JB weld, epoxy? Mm -mm. It's a nicely formed metal flare sealing to a perfectly machined metal flare. Metal to metal, zero leaks because they're made right. That's why a lot of people are a little sketched out about making brake lines because you have to have clean flares. If your flare is not clean and 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 well shaped and, and well formed, it's probably not a seal. So you're gonna get some practice on this. It's gonna be fun. Now you guys understand how these seal, right? There's no gasket there. Cool. And now here's a bubble, a bubble flare with a B that they'll sometimes call the ISO flare. This actually is more like a bubble. It's kind of rounded. I'll show you one more picture of those. This rounded bubble is going to seal to this. Uh, let's say this one is convex. This one's concave, but their, their profiles are matching. So they're basically, how would I say this without being offended? They are, they will, they their surfaces will mate together, right? There's, there's a convex to a concave. Two convex, no, two concave, no, convex to a concave, but they have to be clean, well-formed. So if you had like damage on this, let's say that you were working with this brake line and you like nicked it with um, your wrench or something, not good, not good. These need to be clean and well-formed. Now, sometimes the defect could be here, but that's not real common. Probably more of the defect is going to be here. If you mess up a flare, it needs to be reflared. That means the line has to be cut. It might have to be added a section to get the length back. It's kind of a mess, but we're going to mostly be careful. We talked a little about this. So just in summary, inverted double flare, ISO or bubble flare, both of matching fittings. So here's your double flare. And I wanted to point something out. If you look, this flare has a 45 and this fitting in the caliper, for example, has a 42. So they have an interference angle. That means at some point, this angle is going to intersect this angle and it's going to make a solid ceiling ring all the way around the surface. That doesn't need any sort of help if it's well formed. Cool. And then another thing that uh, Toyota specifies is, look, some of, the, some of the older Tundras would actually use a bubble, like an S-type flare. Toyota calls them S flares, and that's a bubble, ISO bubble flare. And then Toyota calls them D flares, and that's just a 45 degree inverted. So Toyota does have both in some instances 
mainly they're going to use the inverted though. Once in a while, uh, a bubble. I could teach you how to make both. And then there's your brake hose, for example, nice long brake hose. One of the main things that could happen is it can't be easily damaged with objects thrown by the tires or the road hazards, or what I've seen a lot of times, people put big old crazy tires and wheels. And next thing you know, they rub through a brake hose, seen it, seen them road damage too. But I see more of the times people aren't fastening it or attaching it well. And next thing you know, it ends up rubbed through. Um, here's what that hose actually looks like. So let's, let's, uh, we'll, we'll include stainless steel brake lines in this. When I say stainless steel brake lines, I'm talking about the line the pipe of stainless steel. I had a truck with rusted brake lines. I ordered uh, specially manufactured stainless steel brake lines, stainless steel fuel lines, stainless steel transmission lines. I hooked it up. The whole reason I did stainless steel was so that it never rusted again. I, I literally lifted the body partway off that truck to do that job. I wasn't gonna do that no two times. That was Bessie number three. That was the third Bessie. I'll even show you a picture someday. But what a lot of people are saying, oh, I put stainless steel brake lines on. And then I'm usually looking like, hmm? like hmm? do you mean stainless steel braided hoses? Yeah, like brake lines. So let me, let me help you. This is a factory brake line. It has a Teflon inner core, a Kevlar braid over the top of it, another protected layer, a lot of times a stainless steel braid, and then another protective layer, which would most likely be the rubber in this case. So... This already has a stainless steel braid in it from the factory a lot of times. And then it goes to a block and this block is how we're going to bolt it up to the caliper. And just for the record, when we bolt this up, we're going to bolt it up with a bolt that has a hole in it. That's called a banjo bolt. You heard me right. Bang, ding, 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 banjo bolt. The banjo bolt just means it has a hole so the brake fluid can go through the bolt. Those do have copper sealing washers. And it's not uncommon where somebody's trying to do some work and one of those copper washers falls out. If you bolt this block, metal bolt to the metal caliper, it won't seal. Those are way imperfect surfaces. It won't seal, there's no chance it's gonna seal. You need to have a gasket if it has a block like this. There's gonna be a gasket between the bolt and the block and between the block and the caliper. Two copper ceiling washers. And there's a torque spec on there. And they have to be clean. Have to, okay? So back to this. If you put stainless steel braided brake hoses on, there's one main advantage. And a lot of times the stainless steel is thicker and tighter woven. So there might not be a minimal amount of bulging on the hose like this, like bulging. But generally speaking, it's not for street cars. It'd be for like, oh yeah, I take my car to the track and I slam the brake so hard to hit 2000 PSI. These brake hoses from the factory could withstand that, but they may, they may flex a little. So you might get just a slight, almost imperceptible sponginess to your pedal and a stainless steel hose would be a little bit more firm, but that's it. All right, so for example, this one's been rubbed through this one is not rubbed through. What all going on here? What the heck is happening there? I'll help you. What happened there, somebody did a brake job and when they put the caliper back on, they forgot. They pulled the caliper off and it twisted and they put it on twisted. You'd actually have to unbolt the caliper and flip it. Right? That happens all the time. This is gonna be a leak pretty soon. This one is actually going to cause a reduction in pressure to that wheel, and you're probably going to get a pull. You're going to jam the brakes, full pressure to the right, less pressure to the left. It's going to pull to the right. Roberto, is that about pull? Go ahead. Um, I just wanted to ask, how sensitive are those brake lines? Because I know that we need to use the hooks and stuff, but that's a good, I'm not really that's sure. That's a good I'll... question. So I'm going to tell you – this is what I usually do. I'm going to tell you the book answer as your instructor. And then I'm going to tell you what I know to be true. When my name is Mo, Mo Canick, like this. First answer. You always need to hang them. Uh, you, you, you don't want that caliper to hold, you know, to be dangling by the hose. 
So that's why you have caliper hangers. If you remove it, hang it on something. Sometimes you can hold it up here. Once in a while, I'll run a zip tie through it or something like that. You, it, it will say all over service information. You do not dangle the hoses. Now, <laughs> most you, well, uh, I ain't gonna say that I ain't done it and not had a problem with it. Sometimes I, I, I've made a couple mistakes and I've had it set up on a control arm or something and it's fallen off and dangled by the hose for a second and I haven't really had a problem. So it's best practice to properly hang it. But if something happens, don't be like, oh my gosh, it's definitely ruined. It might be all right. It might be. Hopefully that answers your question. Uh, <clears throat> let me, I might need these later. So let me just keep these up here. That's, that's how you know we're talking to mole. All right, cool. So then like, here's an example of that banjo bolt. See the ceiling washers? They both have to be there. I had a guy about four years ago tell me, oh yeah, I'm gonna do the brake job on my brother's truck and whatever. And he's like texting me on the group chat. And then I even talk, called and talked to him. We talked, he's like, ever since I did it, I got a brake fluid leak. And I said, well, what'd you do? Well, did you undo the caliper? No. And then I said, did you, did you mean to undo the caliper bolts and accidentally undo the line? Well, yeah, but I already tightened it. He said, Why'd you withhold that information from me? I'll bet you every dollar in my pocket, which is not much, that you dropped one of the copper washers. Nope, I looked, I looked. Take it apart, count them. How many did you count to? One. You're missing one. Period. If you're calling to have me like make you feel better, I'm not a real empathy. My wife is the most empathetic person I've ever met. Whatever's wrong, she feels bad. She'll console you. She'll tell you she feels... You guys, will, that's not me. I'll give you the solution though, but it won't be with a whole lot of emotion. So I told this guy, uh, you need to find it. Don't call me back until you found it. Well, I looked and I can't find it. Well, I can't help you find it. All I can tell you is why it's leaking. Don't call me back until you've, don't care what you got to do. Roll the truck back, scour the floor. Strip your clothes if you think it's stuck in the in the fold of your jeans. Find the ceiling washer or go to the store and get another ceiling washer. I'm not the one who's going to sit next to you and like kind of cry about how it sucks. I'm just, that's not. Find the washer. Now, what do you think happened? He found the washer. Put the washer on. He torqued it to spec. And ta-da, there's no more brake leak. So it's not rocket science here. But if you lose it or it's damaged and you need to get a new one, they'll leak brake fluid there. And that's kind of the thing. Now I'll give you a fake, a little, well, <clears throat> I'll give you one of these. I've had them leak even with a brand new washer and I've torqued them to like five or six foot pounds over the spec and I've had that stop the leak. So this would be one of the few things I may actually over torque on purpose to stop the leak. Okay, you clear? All right, so kind of continuing. So you understand mostly the uh, how the brake system works, but we need to discuss how we split the amount of brake force. And it's going to depend on the vehicle. So like, for example, um, if we have a front engine rear wheel drive vehicle, typically 40% of the weight's on the rear and 60% is on the front, right? Because we've got an engine in the front we got a transmission kind of in the middle and we got a rear axle in the rear. That's got like a 60, 40 split. We want about 60% or maybe a little more of our braking in the front, maybe about 40 in the rear. Now let's switch that to, let's say like a Camry. Look at that. We've only got about 20% on the rear and about 80 on the front. We want to distribute our forces differently on a Camry versus a Tacoma. And that's not what the technicians do. That's what the engineers do. So they design the system to work well with the vehicle weight distribution. Of course, everybody would love 50-50. If you had 50-50, then you could have 50-50 brakes. But I don't even know if that's technically true because then you got to deal with, you know, the inertia, the shift of the weight onto the front and stuff. But, but again, you're just understanding there's a reason why it's split the way that it's split. Now let's go into what, what type of uh, splits there are. So if you have that uh, 
60-40, you could probably get away with the front rear split because they're fairly even. But if you had that Camry front wheel drive, can you imagine if you blew a front brake line when 80% of your braking is on the front and you just have your two rear little crappy drums to try to stop that car? Does that sound safe? That don't sound safe. So we'll come up with some different designs. So here's like a truck, conventional split, front and rear. Love it. Your front brake line blows, you still got rear brakes, and that's probably enough to stop your truck. Camry. Uh, no. We're going to do, we're going to make that the X pattern. So we're, we're going to basically have, instead of primary, secondary, we're going to have primary to the left front and the right rear and secondary to the right front and the left rear. So if our secondary line blows, which brakes still work? On the camera. You don't have to answer, but you should at least be thinking. And if you're snoozing, well, the front. shame on you. So we're still going to have the left front working and the right rear working. See how that's going to be just much more stable, right? If it was a Camry and 80% of the braking was up here and 20% was back here, you ain't going to stop that car. That's going to be a nightmare. So that's why on, on front wheel drive, front engine, we're typically going to do a, a, a cross design, an X design. Cool. Kind of makes sense. Now let's break this down a little more. If you had a blown uh, secondary cup seal or a blown secondary uh, circuit, you know, line, what do you think this car would feel like when you go to stop it though? Because couldn't they have done like a left side primary and a right side secondary? Yeah, I see in the chat. I'd agree it's probably going to pull to the left, but not that horribly because you have the left front and the right rear working. So at least they're maybe going to help balance each other out a little bit, but it is probably still going to pull to the left. See, so the X is 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 the best for stability. What it Wouldn't that call hopping? I don't know if hopping would be the, the, the main thing the customer would complain about. I think what the customer is going to complain about is my red brake lights on my brake pedal feels like it's just about on the floor and my car doesn't stop very well. I'm not sure I'd say hopping, but maybe it could in some instance. Cool. So now you guys know how, now you guys know about the uh, diagonal design. Um, and so if for some reason you had a car come in and you stepped on the brakes and the right front and the left rear were turning, but the left front and the right rear weren't, you know, like, all right, I got a problem in either the secondary or the primary circuit. And you could kind of troubleshoot that master cylinder, figure out if it's air in the lines or if it's a defective master cylinder, you know, maybe using those plugs, like I was saying, cool. Cause that would, that would be how you pursue that. And then again, this, this talks about just the weight transfer. And so we're obviously going to put more weight on the front tires when we're braking. So they figure all sorts of details about, and, and uh, Toyota calls this um, brake force distribution. So they do a lot of studies on this and we're going to basically manipulate our brake pressure to optimize or maximize our, our stopping distances and our brake performance. So the first thing is going to be proportioning. So proportioning all has to do with the front to rear split. Proportioning valves reduce pressure to the rear wheels when their load is reduced during moderate to severe braking. Now, I made a cool video that's going to show that. Um, but, but what that means is like, let's say initially you start stepping on the brake pedal. Let's say 100 PSI, you're going to get front and rear at 100. 200 PSI front and rear 200, 300, the same, 400, the same. After 400, we're going to start limiting the rear, right? So if you keep pushing the brake pedal, your rear might get up to 450 and your front might go to 700. Then your rear might get up to 500 and your front may be at a thousand. So we'll basically keep them applying the same. And then we're going to have a breaking point where the front's going to increase and the rear is going to be limited. Now you tell me, why do you think we want to limit the rear brakes under really heavy braking. Give you a clue. Give you a clue. More of the cars in the front, the weight's being shifted to the front. 
all this stuff is on the front. And if we try to really jam those rear brakes, it's going to get out of control. It's going to, it's going to possibly send you into a spin, you know, fishtailing at a minimum, possibly spin it out. So that's basically the job of the proportioning valve. If you ever had rear brakes that are locking up, you'd want to be looking into that proportioning valve. So let's say the ASC asked you, uh, technician A, something, 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 and the rear brakes are locking up. Technician A says to inspect the proportioning valve. You'd be like, all right, that sounds good. The proportioning valve is limiting the pressure to the rear brake, so I like it. Technician B says, well, you don't know the other valves, so we'll skip that. All right, cool, that's its overall thing. It can be pressure sensitive, which is normal, but it can also be load sensitive, so that's going to be more for a truck. So if you have a truck, you can put stuff in the bed. And if you have an empty bed, it's going to work one way. But if you have a whole bunch of stuff in the bed, we could actually send more brake pressure back there. And we will. And we do. That's coming up. And then, you know, I think a lot of this has to also do with the tire to road friction. So when we have less weight on the rear, we don't have a whole lot of force on the tires and they do tend to break loose easier. So just can, the tires are part of this equation as well. So you could have all the great brake force distribution, but if your tires are shot and it's wet, the brakes aren't really going to work as designed. They're counting on those tires. The tires are the only thing between your car and the road. Think about that. All right, so we get into load transfer a little bit. Here's that proportioning valve, like I was saying. They increase, 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 increase. They start splitting at, let's say, 425 in this case. Now, the proportioning valve limits the rear curve, and the, and the proportioning valve does not limit the front curve. If we had no proportioning valve, it would keep going up linear, but because we put the proportioning valve in, it's going to break it off and start to kind of reduce it. Now, how that is determined, they do, they do studies. They'll do, actually do studies and they'll say, this is the ideal curve. And you can't get an ideal curve. All, you basically can't do a curved line. You can do a straight line. So they're going to make a break point that's going to, as closely as possible, follow the ideal curve. That's the type of work engineers do. A lot of math and stuff. Um, I saw that question. I'm going to answer that question. Where is it located? Great question. And I will tell you but it's not what you think. Now, a double proportioning valve. This is going to be more than likely for our X system, for our split system, because we've got a right front circuit and a left front circuit and a right rear circuit and left rear circuits. So that means we can't just have one proportioning valve. We'd have to have two. So essentially it's two proportioning valves, but it's in double, it's in a, it, they're doubled up in one housing. So there's one proportioning valve, but there'll be at least two lines going in and at least two lines coming out and sometimes more, as you can see. So it's kind of interesting. Um, and you guys use in the chat well, no problem. I'm just gonna answer that when I see it uh, because I can answer it cleaner after we covered it. So a pressure sensitive proportioning valve, that's the normal one, back up. This is pressure sensitive. It proportions at a specific pressure, cool. So that's just the normal. Uh, this one, this is the, the pressure sensitive. This is kind of how it looks. You're not likely to ever take one apart. To be honest with you, I've never had one apart either. So don't feel bad. It basically all works on the springs. Once it gets to a heavy braking, the, one of these springs is actually going to open up and it's going to limit the amount of brake fluid. It's kind of actually going to res restrict it. It's called the crack point. Anyway, I think you mostly get it. This is one that's combined. But this one is actually, this is actually a combination valve. And so I'm going to just point one thing out. There's quite a few things happening here. So it's proportioning, but also what is this? Could you guys tell what this thing was? This is a proportioning valve and a meter valve, but why is there a wiring there? Why is there an electrical component? It's a brake warning slip, a brake warning switch. So this is actually also a pressure differential valve. So this, 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 there's a lot going on on this valve and we may come back to this one. So here's an example of a, of a proportioning valve installed. So where is it? If it's a pressure sensitive, it could be right here at the master cylinder. 
I actually show one of these in the video I made. That is not how it came from the factory. That was added um, by the builder of the, of the simulator. Okay, it could be there. Now, when we get into adjustable, that's one of the things on your discussion. They have adjustable valves that are a lot of times near the master cylinder with a knob on them. So let's just say you were to build, um, all right, I'll make this one funny. Not that it's a joke, but it is. So let's say you were to build some really cool Honda Civic. You know, I got to show you some pictures of the, of the Civic I did, right? But not today. Let's say you were to build a wildly cool Honda Civic, but you were to LS swap it. Mm, you know what I'm saying? You take the four-cylinder engine out and you put a big old V8 in the front of that thing. Think of how those rear brakes are going to work now. You tell me, what's going to happen when you give it heavy braking? Mm, 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 mm. They're going to catch on fire. <laughs> They're going to be probably going to lock up and just skid out. And so, so essentially what you're saying is because we've added so much weight to the front, we now have less weight in the back proportionally. And so we want the rear to do less braking. Well, you can get an adjustable proportioning valve and install it with a knob on it. And you could go out and jam the brakes. And if the rear brakes lock up, you could turn the knob, go out again. If the rear brakes still lock up, turn the knob some more. Eventually you'll get to the point where the brakes are no locking, no longer locking up, but it's right on the edge of locking up. And that's going to give you the best performance. So they literally have a knob that you can turn. That's a, that's an adjustable, like it's aftermarket really. So especially with a kit car builder or something, um, pretty neat. Now here's load sensitive. And this is one of the ones that we were talking about a little bit. And I saw in the, in the chat, this is where you guys in the chat are correct. If it's a load sensitive proportioning valve, it's basically going to change depending on the suspension. So we'll look at this one. And just for right now, we'll say if this rod is pushed up, we're going to actually have more brake fluid. And if this rod is pulled down, we're going to actually have less brake fluid. What that looks like, like right here, if you guys know, if you load a whole bunch of weight in your pickup bed, you know that the, the frame is going to squat lower, right? And that's actually going to change. There's a linkage right here and it's going to change it to give you more braking when it's squatting. And then, so we'll put, we'll put a, we'll put a real life situation to this. Now my truck doesn't have this, but if it, the old Tacomas that you guys see, it's not even a Tacoma. It's like a 92 Toyota truck that somebody's hauling like a bajillion things of cardboard and the thing is totally loaded to the max, they might actually have it. So let's just say they load, um, well, like what I did, I rolled down to, uh, this one was actually Costco. Costco had a really good, a really good uh, hardwood floor. It's technically laminate, but I needed a whole pallet. So I bought a whole pallet. That pallet weighed 2000 pounds. The, the limit I'm supposed to put in my bed is 600. So as you can tell, I'm slightly over. We loaded that 2,000 pound pallet in the back of my truck and it looked like, what do they call that? The Carolina lean or something? That thing was like popping a wheelie going down the road, but it, but it did it. But during that, let's just say I did have an adjustable proportioning valve. There's so much weight on there. We would wanna, we would wanna send a lot of brake pressure back there, right? But then I got home and at the time I had a big forklift here when I was doing construction and I literally unloaded it. And as I was picking up the pallet, the truck was just following it up, 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 up until I finally got it up and out. So like the reason that we do this is because a truck can go from unloaded to loaded in a moment and from loaded to unloaded in a moment. So you're not going to get down there and turn a knob and tweak some stuff. You're just going to tie it into the suspension and have it be proportioned better, have it be stopping better while it's loaded and still better while it's unloaded. You get the best of both worlds. So this was common on those older Toyotas and, and some older trucks as well. These are mostly gone and I'll explain to you why. So this is kind of showing it again, the proportioning valve. We'll actually change, we'll actually either like Let's say this one, we've kind of closed it off. That's going to give us less pressure. Or this one, we've kind of opened it. That's going to give us more pressure. So we'll change how much we level it. I saw that question in the chat. I will answer. Here's that load sensing proportioning valve. You can see it's it 
it does a number of different things. Um, additionally, if you're going to do a brake bleeding and it has load sensing proportioning valve, you may have to do something with the valves to bleed the front brakes and or the rear brakes. Sometimes they'll bypass from the rear and also send it into the front. It's kind of crazy how to do that. This is rear brake fluid pressure that goes to the load sensing valve, but it basically dumps the excess off into the front and that's kind of monitoring. It does some interesting stuff. Now, if we were to, uh, well, a little bit later, how we adjust this, this is shown. So just understand, we may need to set this in a certain position to be able to bleed the brakes. I'll just say that for now. Now, electric electronic brake proportioning. So here we go. If it was a metering, if it was a uh, proportioning valve on a car, it's most likely going to be at the master cylinder. If it's a load sensing proportioning valve on a truck, it's most likely going to be near the rear leaf springs. However, you're unlikely to find that valve anywhere because a lot of times we're just, as you can see, it integrates electronic brake proportioning function within the hydraulic control unit on the vehicles that require it. Hang on, that's a coyote, one sec. Oh, you guys are lucky because if he gets too close to my house, I'll be turning the video off. Give me one second, please. Can you hear that or no? You guys are, you guys are loving. Oh, good. You can't hear it. Well, that's good. Peach. He shouldn't be out here right here at this time. Give me a moment, one moment. All right, there we go. So we're back. Screen two, and here we go. All right, so now because we've gone with ABS and their electronic, rather than doing a mechanical valve, we could either A, we could put the valve in the ABS unit, or B, more likely, think about it, we're watching the front wheels speed and we're watching the rear wheel speed. So if the rear wheel speed becomes zero, what's that tell us is happening? Think about that. Rear wheel speed is zero. What's occurring? The brakes are locking up in the rear. Bingo. So through the use of ABS, we could limit the brake pressure to the rear and we could still allow the brake pressure to the front or the other way around. So once we once ABS started to become standard, we we no longer really need all these proportioning valves and stuff because the ABS is the ultimate proportioning valve, essentially is, is what's changed. So you'll look and you'll look and you'll look for this proportion valve. You're like, I can't find it. That's because it ain't there. That's why it's electronic brake proportioning, because we're using ABS instead. Pretty cool. Now here's another valve. The metering valve has a specific purpose. The, if you think about it, if you're going down the highway and you jam on the brakes, if you had your front brakes apply first, a lot of times it's gonna kind of cause the car to nosedive and that's gonna make it a little, how would you say, unsettling. So what they actually find is if it's if it delays the front brakes for a split second and it's and it applies the rear brakes first, that kind of settles the car in, and then you start cranking the front brakes. So essentially, metering valve delays the application of the front brakes. That's all it does. You definitely won't find a metering valve. They haven't really been on cars since the 80s and maybe even earlier. However, it's kind of interesting. Once in a while, the ASC will still have a question that's metering valve related. So I'll give you typically a, a type of thing that they may they may ask. Um, a customer states when they very when they just start to tap their brake pedal, the front tires lock up. That would more be like, oh, the metering valve is not delaying the application. See, so. That one's fairly minor. 
Um, additionally, what's funny is the metering valve a lot of times can have some sort of a lever or um, a knob or something, some sort of a mechanism, because when you go to bleed the brakes, if the metering valve is delaying the application, that means it's stopping the fluid. So if the fluid stopped, you can't bleed them. So you'd actually have to do something to the metering valve to be able to bleed the brakes. But again, that's old school. So that's like a nice to know and a maybe one ASC question, but you know, not proportioning valve is still a little, probably a little more relevant. And then we kind of talked about it again, the metering valve, when the brake pedal is released, the metering valve is pushed closed by the spring. So then the metering valve essentially opens up when you're releasing the brakes, but when you apply it, it'll delay it and then let them apply. It's kind of fun. If the system is diagonally split, that X design, they'll have to have a double metering valve. They would have to do both. Um, and then as you can see, it even talks about most metering valves are designed to be manually held open when bleeding. And I think I have a picture of one a little bit later. Now this one, um, we grouped this one in with the other ones, but in reality, it's really different. The pressure differential valve doesn't modify pressure. So the metering valve and the proportioning valve, they modify pressure. The pressure differential valve, it's actually really just a sensor. It's a valve with a sensor. It's, the purpose of the valve is just to sense a problem. So let's take a look at it. If it monitors any difference in pressure between the two separate systems, it can turn the light on. If there's a leak anywhere in the system, it'll illuminate. If it's a moderate leak, I should say. If it's a, if it's a seep that doesn't affect pressure, it won't trigger the light. But if it's a leak that actually makes your pressure different, like there's a differential, it will trigger a leak. It's kind of hard to explain, but the picture is actually worth a million words. So here you go. Let's say this left side is front wheels. This right side is rear wheels. Now, for just a moment, ignore the fact that that can be different with a proportion of valve. Let's just say they're equal, perfectly equal, because they are at least up to about 400 or 500 PSI anyway. When you start to apply the brakes, let's say we have 300 PSI in the rear and we have a leak in the front and it only makes 200 PSI. What's the differential between those two? 300 here, 200 here. It's a differential of 100 PSI. Now I want you to make sure that you understand this. If we have 300 PSI here, that's going to push on this piston. And normally we'd have 300 PSI here, which is going to push on this piston. And if we have 300 and 300, what happens to that piston? It doesn't even move. But what if we have 300 here and 200 here, or, or look on the screen even better. If we have 300 over here and 200 over here, what happens to this piston? It moves which way? To the right. Uh, though I think you guys can see it my same way. We have more pressure on the right and less on the left. So it would go to the left, assuming you guys can see this the same way I see it. So if you look at the shape of this, this is something I want you to pay attention to right here. This sensor comes down and there's a little pin right here. And if this valve was center, you see how this area has got kind of like a low spot. If this valve was center, this pin would drop into this low spot. That becomes an open circuit. But as soon as we get a difference in pressure from right to left, it shoves the valve over, it ramps up and it lands in this high spot. That is a closed circuit. So what happens when we have a difference in pressure? What happens to the circuit? It closes and illuminates the light. Bingo. That's it. So that's how these switches work. You may have the float switch in the master cylinder, or you may have a pressure differential switch that is in the hydraulic system. You won't have both. There's no reason for both. In a way, I tend to kind of like this one because if you have any difference in pressure, boom, it's going to throw the light. Essentially, this Essentially, this valve is grounded and it provides ground or it doesn't provide ground. That's pretty much what it does.
you diagnose them the same way, but uh, they do function drastically different. The reason that most manufacturers will go with the switch in the master cylinder is this type of switch, it, it only works if there's a substantial pressure differential, right? So if you have like the tiniest little drip, it's probably not going to trigger this light. Whereas if you have the level sensor in the reservoir, eventually that tiny drip will become a low fluid level and that will trigger the light. So see, it's probably a little safer for the manufacturer to do the level sensor. Cool, but that's how that one works. You definitely have to know how to, how to diagnose this. These I've seen on the ASC, they could ask you several different questions. And then uh, maybe not last, but next and not least, this is a combination. So this is that one that we showed earlier. This one is actually doing metering because it's got the front brakes coming to it. So it meters the front brakes. It's also doing proportioning to the rear brakes. And as you can see, it's got this electrical uh, sensor or switch and this little pin and it goes to this piston. This is actually a pressure differential valve as well. So this valve does three functions all in one, metering, proportioning, and pressure differential. So what do we call it? A combination. It's a combination valve. Anything that combines two functions is a combination valve. In that way, it's kind of frustrating. Um, Honda Civics, for example, have a combination valve. You pop the hood and you look right there in the firewall. A lot of times you'll see a bunch of brake lines go into this one crazy looking valve. That's a combination valve. I actually don't know all the functions of that particular valve, but I know it does more than one function. Um, and then now let's talk about diagnosis. So this was a lot of theory and now we're about to kind of shift. We still got quite a bit to go, so I'm gonna proceed. So best way to test control valves, connect a pressure gauge. I hate to do it, but if I had a real problem that I couldn't figure out, I would, and here's the SST. So you literally have to, you literally have to take bleeders out and thread this into the bleeder hole, or sometimes even take hoses off and thread it into the hose. That means brake fluid. That means bleeding. That means a mess. This is not my first choice for real. But if you had a problem where the rear brakes were locking up and you couldn't really figure it out and you had to test the proportioning valve, this will test the proportioning valve to exact specifications. So know it's there. The dealers would have this. You can buy them cheap, but it's just not my ideal. All right, so now about load sensing proportioning valves. If we were working on um, one of those old Toyota trucks and we needed to do load sensing proportioning valve adjustment, there would be a spec. A lot of times they'll tell you to put a certain amount of weight in the bed, and then they'll tell you to measure from, from the, the uh, nut center of the stud right here to the center of the stud right here, and it will give you that number and it'll basically tell you to either um, adjust, you know, obviously if that number was wrong, you could loosen this nut and tighten this nut and that's gonna adjust it one way or the other way. Um, so they may have this type of linkage. Sometimes they actually have um, a uh, adjustment right here. Sometimes what they'll do, they'll tell you to adjust this to a certain length, let's say uh, 200 millimeters, and then they'll have a nut, a lock nut, and a little screwdriver adjustment slot where you can actually turn the pressure up and down, but you'd have to have the gauge on it, right? So it's kind of interesting. There's there's quite a bit of uh, mechanics to adjusting a load sensing proportioning valve. Good news, I guess, mostly they're gone. So we don't spend a ton of time on that, but you do need to understand that in theory. Here's one of the steps for testing the metering valve. So it's talking about uh, disconnecting the inlet line, connecting gauges, stepping on the pedal, and there should be, uh, you should be able to put a, a gauge before the valve and a gauge after the valve. When you step on the pedal, the gauge before the valve should spike and the gauge after the valve should have a slight delay and then increase. That's to tell you that the metering valve is delaying the application. So you can see you'd need actually two valves. And luckily, we don't really do metering valves anymore. So good job. And that's uh, kind of nice. And then proportioning valve, that one um, is probably worth spending a little bit more time on. 
So it's essentially going to say, going to put a gauge on the front brakes, going to put a gauge on the rear brakes. You're going to step on the pressure and they're going to both rise together. And then at some point, per the specifications, they should start to break off. Your front will continue to rise linear and your rear will start to limit it. It's not that it'll stop it, but it won't rise at the same rate. And you would verify the pressures at various differences um, with your gauges. And so that's something that's possible to encounter, but probably still not real likely. Um, I actually show that in the video I'm gonna share with you. So it's a pretty good one. And then the pressure differential valve, those are kind of cool because basically what we're doing right here, we've got the black lead on ground. We've got the red lead on the pressure differential terminal. And what's OL mean? You guys remember? OL. Don't tell me overload. I'll reach out to the of over out limit. limit. Out of limit. Yeah, over, over limit, limit or out of limit. Either of those are good. Infinite's even fine. So uh, the way I like to think of it is this. Your meter has the ability to read up to mega ohms, right? Millions of ohms. If it's beyond millions of ohms, it's out of the limit. It's over the limit of what it can see. That basically means it's open. Both infinite's good. It's open, right? So right now, if I'm showing OL between the chassis ground and the terminal, is this switch providing ground or not? No. Exactly. No. What if I were to do that and then have somebody step on the brakes and then crack a bleeder loose? What should happen? One bleeder. It should build, it should remain pressure on one side and lose pressure on the other side, which should throw that piston and then it should ground it, right? And all of a sudden you should get 0.2 ohms or something. You kind of follow that step a little bit. It's fairly simple, I think. That's how you'd actually test one. Um, and so that's what we're seeing. Oh, look, it was actually 0, 0.0 ohms once we opened a bleeder. And then the thing is, that's kind of crazy, is sometimes you have to do some sort of a reset procedure to get that piston to recenter. It's like if you throw it all the way to the left and then you close the bleeder and you have 300 and 300, that's not going to necessarily make it move to the right. Sometimes you actually have to open up a bleeder on the other side and kind of balance it out. They can be a little bit funny. Roberta, you still got a question? Did you lower your hand? I was going to ask if it had to be, if you had to be like making it function so that you can get the reading. Yeah, exactly. You, you, would, you would initiate an artificial failure of the hydraulic brake system to see if the light comes on and basically see if you do this. Now, I mean, to be honest, I'll be very, I'll be very honest. I wouldn't even bust the meter out. Remember, I'm Mo, the flat rate -o man. All I'm going to do is I'm going to jump up in the car and I'm going to look for the red brake light, press on the brake pedal, crack a bleeder loose and the red brake light comes on. I know it's good. You know, you don't even, technically you didn't even need to get the meter, but the meter's being thorough and it's helping you to understand. So we're showing it. Now, once again, I have never done this on a, on a real car. I kind of doubt you guys will, but you still need to know about it. If they gave me a car with this problem today, I could hundred percent diagnose it. It's just not real common. It's just like, it's old school. You know, we've gone to ABS and a lot of this stuff is just gone and we're using sensors in the, in the reservoir more so anyway. So it's, it's still good. Some of this is ASC concept. Now, as we get into, um, you know, more of these inspections, we lock, we looked at some of them. Uh, if it's a car that's modified with wide tires or, you know, uh, coilovers where they've eliminated some of the factory brackets or if it's off-road or whatever, they're probably more prone to damage to the hoses, to the lines, right? We're, we're inspecting right here. This one's pretty easy. We're looking at these brake lines to see if there's rust, kinks, damage. We're looking at the hoses for rubbing, chafing, bulging, cracks, etc. If you see uh, some sort of a damage on that, that's something I would absolutely recommend or at a minimum note because they do have issues from time to time. It's, it's not real common. It's very uncommon in a new car, but if you get those old high mileage, 10, 15 year old cars, you better, you need to be looking at this stuff because it does happen. And then looking to see if there's any loose fittings, et cetera. 
Um, again, if we had to if we had to replace something, one thing to really uh, consider is, let's say that um, let's say that for example, you had to replace a brake hose. If you're going to replace a brake hose, the line needs to be in good condition because the line threads to the brake hose. So if you have a bad brake hose, you got to look and see. Do you think it's going to come off from the line or you think the line might get messed up too? And then after you're going to need to open the bleeder. And if the bleeder is rusted or really messed up, you want to look at all that stuff before you sell the job. There's been times in my case where I'll see the, um, let's say a hose, is, a hose is messed up and I'll get ready to sell the hose, but then I'll look and I'll realize the bleeder's rusted and rounded off. And I'm kind of like, you know what? I'm going to sell a hose and a caliper because it comes with the bleeder. And that way I know I'll be able to bleed it and fix it. But you sell that first. You don't sell it after they've committed to one repair and then you add stuff. See, so that's one thing I want to just note with you. And then here it's going to talk about replacing some brake stuff. So here's a cool trick I want you to remember. If you have the brake pedal released all the way, you've exposed the compensating port. So if you pull a hose off, the fluid can leave the reservoir through the compensating port and drain out through the hose you disconnected. But if you slightly depress the brake pedal, depress means push down a little. It doesn't mean unpress. It's like depress, like depression. Like depression is low, right? Push it down. Just like your mood. Push it down and hold it down just a little bit. That will actually block off the compensating port. And when you undo the hose, all the brake fluid won't leak out. Now, why that's such a good trip, a good trick is because if if you ever let all the brake fluid leave the reservoir and you get air in the master cylinder, it takes a long time to bleed. It can be a big pain in the butt to bleed. So the less fluid you have leak out, it's not to save the small cost of fluid, it's to save the time, right? The less fluid you have leak out, the less air you get in, the less bleeding time you're gonna have to spend. But if you're doing this, the brake lights are on and the battery's dead. So you could remove the fuse or you could just put it on the charger. For me, at the shop, put it on the charger. Probably needs to be charged anyway. And then here's an example of undoing the brake the, the brake line. This is a flare nut wrench and this one's holding it again. You guys tomorrow will all be doing uh, brake hose. So the thing to notice with the brake hose, this right hand is holding the hose. This left hand is spinning the line off. Do not go to this hose and try to twist the hose. That's not how those come apart. You'll twist it, you'll break it. If somebody messes up a brake line, I'm gonna, I'm gonna hold you up in front of the class and say, this is who didn't pay attention. And then I'm gonna forgive you and then we're gonna fix it, but I'm not gonna be happy. Make sense? Because I'm telling you now, I want you to pay attention and learn. So we're gonna unthread the fitting. And then after that, we'll pop the clip off and then the brake hose will pull straight out this side. You're gonna do that tomorrow. Now talking about flaring, we'll go through some of the steps. You may not get time to do that tomorrow, but, you, but you're gonna do it soon. So this is a flaring tool. This is a lot of times called the bar. We're setting the brake line depth that it sticks through. We'll watch a video, but you're at least gonna just see some, see some stuff and we'll discuss. We've already had to cut the brake line and file it, by the way. Then we're gonna use this die to do the first form and this one to do the second form. And that's gonna do our double flare. The first part of the flare does one function. The second part of the flare does the other. That's why it's a double flare. It actually folds onto itself snug it up and then that's actually a decent flare that one would seal you got to make sure you put the fitting on first because if you flare it you can't put the fitting on you have to cut your flare off put the fitting on and make a new flare the fitting is trapped see the fitting can't come out that's safety i'll give you um an, another example i normally have a compression fitting but i know where it is it's at the school i can show you but for example this flare could never, this flare holds on this fitting. This fitting could never pop off. But there's another type of fitting that's called a compression fitting. I'll show it to you in person. Compression fitting, you just slide the line in and snug it up. It just kind of pinches it. That's um, illegal. That's literally illegal to be on the car, period. Bail inspection, CHP, probably in California, they'd let you get away with it. All they're going to do is see if you got cats or not. But in other states, 
that's like you can't register your vehicle if you have a compression fitting on there. Compression fittings are faster. Flared fittings are proper repair. They can't pull apart. They could leak and you can have some issues, but they can't just pull apart and have, boom, have the brake fluid be gone. So we'll cover compression fittings one more time. Um, and then here's another one talking about making an ISO flare. You see, it's kind of similar, but instead of setting the depth with that little die, you actually set it with this little wrench. And then this is a one step job. Boom, that's gonna make the, the bubble right there. One and done. And there's a bubble flare. Cool, so not real hard. Those tools, I have some actually right below. I think I have them here. I might have them over there, but I have both of the, the inverted double flare and I have the bubble ISO bubble flare tools here. Even though I don't really make brake lines anymore, mainly because if I'm ever working on something, it goes sideways, I can get myself out of trouble. Makes sense. If I have to, I can fabricate a line. Now we'll talk a little more about bleeding. Manual vacuum and pressure. I described you the manual bleeding. That's the one where you say, hey, Tony, pump the pedal, hold the pedal, right? Vacuum bleeding, I'm going to show you in person. That's when we're going to actually hook up the hose, the air hose from the compressor to the bleeder and hook up that to the actual, um, I did that backwards. I'm going to hook up the shop air hose to the, it is the bleeder, but how do I say it? To the vacuum bleeder tool. And then the vacuum bleeder tool hose is going to go to the fitting on the caliper. We're going to loosen it. We're going to squeeze the trigger and we're going to use the shop air to pull out fluid and air. Nobody has to press the brake pedal. Cool. So that's a nice, convenient way to do it. I hate it. I find too often somehow air ends up in the system and I end up having to do manual bleeding anyway. But my favorite is actually pressure bleeding. Pressure bleeding is where we're going to pressurize brake fluid that's new, pressurize the master, pressurize everything, and then you can just crack the bleeder and it'll just run out. It'll just run out, run out, run out, run out until I'm happy with it. Let's say I'm flushing it because it's old brake fluid. I'll see the dirty brake fluid go, 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 go. And when it's clean, I'll let it go for a little bit longer and then I'll snug it up and I'll do that four times and I'm done. Typically when we're bleeding, it's not critical, but the general rule of thumb is we want to start with the furthest from the master cylinder. So that would be the right rear, then the left rear, then the right front, then the left front. That's the general rule of thumb. Now there's a bit of an exception. If you're doing something with, let's say, a Prius that has that integrated ABS master cylinder, and the Prius is funny because when you press the brake pedal on a Prius, it's a stroke simulator. You're not even braking. It's just basically giving a symbol, a signal to have the regenerative braking kick in, and it's going to use MG2 to regenerate the brakes by varying the frequency in the inverter. If you really want to get technical, we could go there. But it's not going to apply any brakes at all. It's going to use MG2, motor generator two, to slow you down. Customers like, ah, brakes feel great. Brakes didn't even apply. So if you're doing something like a Prius or another hybrid, you actually need to go in with the scan tool and tell it you want to perform brake bleeding. And then it's going to tell you exactly what wheels to go to. And if you're using the scan tool to do uh, brake bleeding on a, on a hybrid or on a, any ABS, if you're using the scan tool, the scan tool will tell you which wheels it's critical. You do those wheels at that time because it may only have those circuits open internally. So if it opened up the right rear and you're goofing off on the left rear, you're wasting time. You're not getting anything done. So that's a little bit in depth. The good news for you is it's all laid out in TIS and you're going to do that e-learning, which is going to help you as well. But to me, pressure bleeding is my favorite. Right. So here's manual bleeding. Like we talked about, we're going to have the, the hose and here's the old dirty brake fluid come out. And we got Tony pumping the pedal, the negative of manual brake bleeding. It's very easy to have your reservoir go low. So if you do all this bleeding and you forget to go up there and retop off the reservoir and the reservoir goes empty, you just hit the reset button completely and maybe worse than when you started. Cause now you have air at the very beginning and you got to get the air all the way through the system and it just sucks. So be careful with that. Here's the vacuum bleeding, the air hose, 
the shop air hose is on the vacuum bleeder and the vacuum bleeder hose is on the caliper brake bleeder. And we're just using air to draw it through. Like I said, it's convenient. You guys are going to gravitate towards that and that's fine. But when you're done, the brake pedal has to feel right. And if it doesn't, you're going to have to redo it. All right. So there's that vacuum bleeder. Cool. Kind of similar. Here's the pressure bleeder, my favorite. This is going to literally be attached to the cap. This is going to be brake fluid, not air. And the brake fluid is going to end up slightly pressurized. And once we're slightly pressurized, we can just crack the bleeders and it'll just flow. And we're pressurizing brake fluid so we don't ever have to worry about it running low because we're just pumping more brake fluid in there. The negative is you have to have a lot of brake fluid in the pressure bleeder to do it. All right, so it's a pretty, pretty nice system. Flushing, guess what? It's the same as bleeding, except you do it for long enough where all the dirty fluid comes out and it's only clean fluid. But the process is the same. You just use more fluid, right? And then let's talk about this. Measuring brake pedal height, I want you to pay attention to. These are some of the things I said we'd cover and now we're there. But this one, I want to make a particular point of. A technician is putting a certain amount of pressure on the pedal and they're using a tape measure or a similar to measure how high off the ground the pedal is. Let's just say this was four inches. It looks like it's about that anyway. If that's four inches, and you, let's say you measured this first before you bled the brakes, and it's four inches, and then you bled the brakes, what should it be when you're done? Or like if you did a brake flush? Four inches? Exactly. Now, this is what I'm gonna tell you because a lot of you are at the similar stage. I was there. When I pulled the car in, I didn't really pay much attention to how the pedal felt. And then I did the brake bleeding and all of a sudden I'm paying all this attention. I'm like, I think it's low. I don't think it's, I don't think I got all the air out. It doesn't feel right. It feels weird. Something's wrong. And then I'm, then I'm starting the car and shutting the car off and I'm pumping. And it's like, is it good or is it bad? And then you'll call me over and I'll jump in and I'll say, eh, it's good. And you'd be like, oh. So look, if you call me over, I'm going to tell you straight up if it's good or bad, but, but I kind of have developed a little bit of a feel for it, but what you should do when you get in the car and you pull it in the shop, you should bring it in, shut it off, pump the pedal a bunch of times till the pedal's kind of firm with the engine off and then measure that distance. If it's four inches and then you do all your, you pull the hose off and you put the hose on, you bleed the brakes. And when you're done, if it's three inches, it's too low to the floor, right? You ain't done yet. See what I'm saying? Then you don't have to come and ask me, is it good? You could say, well, it was four when I started and now it's three. Well, you better get it back to four. Now, if it was four when you started and by the time you did all your work and now it's at four and a half, that's only better, right? Worse is closer to the floor. Better is higher. But if it if there wasn't air in it when you started, you, the best you're going to get is the same. So we're shooting for the same. If it happens to be better than fine, then that actually means there was something wrong before. Make sense? Kind of, sort of. So get in the habit of doing this before you start. And, and, and this one, by the way, we've got a few things we can measure. Measuring free play is one thing, right? Free play is basically when you bring this tape measure over and you'd essentially just lightly move the pedal like this. Click, click, click. You'll feel a little a little uh, play, like a little looseness. Like this is play. You'll feel a little looseness. And a lot of times there's a spec. The pedal should never have no free play. The pedal always needs to have a little bit of free play. The reason is when you release the brakes, that, that master cylinder has to come all the way back, right? To expose that compensating port. It needs a little bit of free play to be all the way back. If it's if there's no free play, that means it's actually being held applied and it may be blocking the compensating port. So a little bit of free play is good. How much? Well, you got to look that up. There will be a spec, right? And then that's kind of what it's saying. We're going to move it around, wiggle it. Then the next one is the brake pedal travel. So the brake pedal travel could be, they'll do this in two different ways. So one, they'll just say, the, the travel is the distance that the brake pedal travels from rest to applied. So you'd basically measure it at full height and then you'd step on the brake pedal and see how low it goes. So if you were at, uh, let's say 12 inches and then you pushed it down to four, we'll make it, you're at 12 and you push it down to six, that'd mean there's six inches of travel. That 
there'd be, you know, potentially a spec for that. Is that in spec? Is it not on spec? Um, but sometimes they'll call it reserve pedal. So I don't typically do it like that. That would be the travel. What I would consider is, I believe it's the next one, right? So there was your travel, travel. That's kind of what we were saying. Reserve pedal, I do differently. What I want you to do with reserve pedal is you see how somebody's pushing the brake pedal to the floor. I just want you to measure from the carpet to the brake pedal. Right there, it looks like that's at about like two and a half. Two and a half off the floor. I don't know if that's good or bad. It depends on the car, but that's the one I want you to start with. Reserve pedal. That's going to be like, how far is it from the floor? Have you ever gotten a car where you push on the pedal and it feels like the pedal's really low? Does that make you feel safe? when it feels like it's almost on the floor. That's not good. That's We want it higher off the floor if possible. But the thing is, how low is too low? I don't know. There's either a spec A or B, you compare it to a known good. So if we're working on a Corolla and there's another Corolla, you check the Corolla for its measurement and then you can compare it to the Corolla that might be broken, right? So that could be relative. That would be the most valuable measurement right there would be reserve pedal. And that's essentially, I would just consider that to be the height of the pedal off the floor. Sometimes we'll call it pedal height too. Roberto, go ahead. Roberto. When inspecting the brake pedal, do you recommend removing the carpet that's on there or the floor mats? Um, it's probably more accurate to remove everything and have it be bare metal to bare metal. However, I don't think I would bother. You know, I think whatever, whatever you do the first time to the second time, I would just be consistent. If you're looking at the specs in TIS, it's going to tell you, it's going to tell you no floor mat and carpet or no carpet. It's probably going to tell you no floor mat, but carpet, right? Because if there's a spec, they can't account for the varying thicknesses of the weather techs versus the OEM and stuff. But but if you're doing this, you're not winging it. You're typically going to be following service manual. So service manual information really um, supersedes what I say. So follow those steps. Fair. All right. So those are some good measurements. We talked about the travel already. Now let's talk for a second about the brake warning light, because you may have a customer come in for my pedal feels weird, or you may have a spongy or you but you also may have a customer comes in for my red brake light is on. So you gotta be able to diagnose those two. Remember we talked about this. There's two categories of brake electrical, at least in this stage. We, we'll, we'll add ABS later. That's module, that's unit five. But in this case, the brake warning light is the red brake light in the dash. That's different than the stop lights. You guys know about the stoplights? Stoplight, you press the brake pedal, the red the red lights come on the back of the car. That's not the brake warning light. A lot of times those are totally unrelated to each other. So if we take a if if we take a look, we're talking about the brake warning light, that's going to be um in the dashboard, right? Here. That is the brake warning light. Now, here's how it could work in an example. 12 volts come off the battery, goes through the fuse, goes to the ignition switch. Ignition switch sends it to the brake warning light. So there's positive at the ignition switch anytime. There's, there's positive at the brake warning light bulb, I should say, anytime the ignition switch is on. From there, all we need to do is something needs to supply it ground. So that would be either the ignition switch proofing circuit. And what that means is like when you turn the key on, they'll do a bulb check and all the lights will come on. So you'll have a module that will provide ground for a second to make sure the red brake light works and that'll take it away and it'll go off. That's good. Or it could be a pressure, dif pressure differential switch. Remember that one? That was the one where if you have 200 and 300, it'll move it. Or if you have zero and, and 100, it would move it. That would, that would provide a ground as well. If there's a defect in the hydraulic pressures, the fluid level switch, that could provide a ground as well if the fluid level is low. Typically, you won't have both of these, but it's a perfect example to be able to cover. And then you have the parking brake light switch. And that one kind of sucks because if your parking brake is on, if your parking brake is applied, it grounds the switch and you get the red brake light. 
So you may have a red brake light and you got to eliminate which ones of these is causing it. So if your red brake light is on, how do you think you could troubleshoot which one of these is, is uh, turning it on? What do you think? I'll help you a little bit. One of those four items is causing a ground. I had this problem with my car a couple months ago. Oh yeah? And I thought, I thought for a second, I thought the parking brake switch is stuck, like electronically mm -hmm. it's stuck. But then I realized one of my calipers was leaking brake fluid. Exactly. So if you inspect your brake fluid level with your eyes and it's low, you know which one's causing it. And then you could top it off with fluid and verify it goes out precisely. Let's say you did all your inspections, you couldn't find anything. You'd have to recognize one of those four is providing a ground. So if you were to go to your, let's say, pressure differential switch and disconnect it and the light didn't go away, it wasn't that. Reconnect it. And then if you were to go to your, your fluid level switch and you were to disconnect it and the light did go away, uh -huh, uh -huh, it's because that was giving it ground. And then you'd say like, what's up with this switch? The fluid level is good, but the switch is messed up and you probably need a new switch type of thing. See, so it could be that easy. There's one other thing that could happen. And let's say you, you brought it into Sparky's 12 volt audio shop and they installed your radio and they accidentally shot one of their self-tapping screws through your wire and grounded it. Now your circuit is permanently grounded. That would be a short to ground. You would have to troubleshoot that slightly different, but it's it's just a short. I mean, if you take an electrical, you know how to you know how to diagnose a short to ground. You could put your meter on this terminal and your positive lead on this terminal and your negative lead on the on the chassis ground. And if it says zero ohms or 0.2 ohms, you have continuity to ground. If you disconnected all four of these items and you still had continuity to ground, the harness is grounded. Now, unfortunately, you're going to have to, you know, put eyes on the harness and really find out where it is. At that point, you know, that, that could get a little bit more tricky, but it's not complex. It's just going to take time. So... That's kind of the 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 simple explanation. So like we were talking about here, could be any of these. That's the diagram shown a little bit more clearly. This one, by the way, is saying how to diagnose it if it's non-CAN bus. If it's CAN bus, a lot of times, many things can control that light because they're all networked, uh, multiplexed, you may say. So that one's a little different. We'll talk about that. So even just uh, using a test light, personally, I wouldn't waste my time. I, I like the power probe. I know people talk about trash, but I could do I could do some quick diagnosing with my power probe. You know what I'm saying? Keep it right here. Boom. I don't power stuff up much, but I can get a quick voltage reading just the same as a meter, except I can plug it in in one spot right here. I saw you guys had a little, a little discussion about the power probe, so I'm making my position known. I'll connect these two to the battery, positive and negative. And then anything I poke, it'll tell me the voltage on the LCD, 12.6, 12.6, 0 0.2, boom, 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 boom. Not that it's better than a meter. I have my meter right next to it. It's a little more buried, but I'm faster with the power probe. I'm not saying I'm using the power probe to just power everything that I see. Like, let's power that up and let's power that up, right? But this is just basic electrical again, something that you, you learned like, in week five last semester. So no biggie, but yes, the book is going to call out test lights. Textbooks tend to like test lights for some reason, at least to start. So, and then if it's CAN bus, now we got some different. If it's a red brake light on a more modern car, we're going to be checking for DTCs. Most likely a DTC is going to cause that light to come on. We also may be able to go like, for example, uh, if the light is in your um, combination meter, it's most likely being given a communication on the CAN bus line to turn on. Why? Well, you might go in with the scan tool to your master cylinder control unit and see if there's a DTC. Or better yet, if you wanted to know if your brake level warning switch was grounding, you can go in live data. You can see that. For me, I would drastically, above and beyond, prefer this system. I'm more familiar with this system. I can diagnose this system faster. I can disconnect a whole bunch of stuff too. 
but I'd rather hook up the scan tool and go in live data and see is the parking brake applied or released? Is the brake fluid level full or low? Is the pressure differential switch in, in fault or in normal, right? Boom, boom, boom. I could do it a lot quicker. So you see what, what's your main workhorse if it's CAN bus? Are you gonna go for the meter? Or what are you gonna go for? It's your go-to tool. Mine's over there. That'd be the scan tool. So we're gonna go with the scan tool. In your case, text stream, or you can call it, you know, whatever GTS plus or something. So scan tool is gonna be your go-to. Um, this is back to non-CAN bus, seeing test lights, looking like chopsticks and uh, checking it out, right? If you had an issue, you know, you, you may even jump or something to ground to test if ground is good. You can measure for resistance, et cetera. Not a big deal. Stoplight operation is going to be very similar. Um, the main difference is we're dealing more with the brake light switch, which you guys know is typically mounted on the pedal. So if your brakes are released, it's an open circuit. If your brakes are applied, it's a closed circuit. Pretty simple. If you want to know if the brake light switch is working, you could literally, you're going to have voltage coming into the brake light switch. If your pedal's applied, you should have voltage coming out. If your pedal's released, you should not have voltage coming out. If the voltage is coming out all the time, double check your adjustment. If your adjustment is good, then the switch is stuck closed. If you never have brake lights, check for voltage coming in. If there's no voltage coming in, backtrack. Where did it lose power? Maybe the fuse, maybe the harness, whatever. If the voltage is making it to the switch, but it's not making it through the switch, that would be like this, right? 12 volts, zero volts. With the brake pedal depressed, double check the adjustment. If the adjustment's good. Apparently your switch is bad. Who thinks they know why a switch would not pass 12 volts through it and, and it would be a bad switch? Who thinks like, what's going on in there? What do you think? It could have internal resistance. Yeah, so like the most, what helped it click for me was when I took one apart and I saw literally corrosion on the contacts and I was like, oh, you got two rusty corroded things touching. That's not going to make a good contact, but you can't see that. You don't want to have to dissect every part. You just need to get good at measuring that. I think you guys would be in pretty good shape for that. Um, and this is the diagnosing. You know, let's say you got one stoplight out. You're not diagnosing a switch if one works and one doesn't work. But if neither of them work, you need, maybe up here at the switch, the fuse, the, 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 the feed voltage, whatever, um, it might be between the switch and, and like a junction, like a splice, right? Basic electrical work. For sure. And they kind of cover it in brakes. I don't know if it's really worth it, but if you ever wanted, you could you could measure resistance of a bulb if you were tripping. Like if you thought the bulb was blown, you can't really see in there. You can look, but sometimes you can't see that well. A bulb is typically going to be, it might be as low as 0.6 ohms, but I see them around 2 ohms or maybe 4 ohms or 0.4 ohms, right around there. Not 10,000 ohms and not 0, 0.0 ohms either. All right, cool. And then checking for voltage. So I wouldn't front probe like this, but if you wanted to check available voltage, this gives you the idea. So some of this will be a little bit of review. But now you guys have made it to where I want you to make it. So this is the plan. I'm going to put up the, uh, the uh, chapter quiz, the Kahoot, and you guys are going to work on those things.